Hello world, good morning, namaste and nisam bulavinaka from Sydney, Australia. I am Sashi Singh and welcome once again to Sashi Singh's Talking Point. May I extend a very warm welcome to you wherever you are watching. Either if you're in Fiji, that's where we have the largest number of viewers, Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom, Canada, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Vanuatu, American Samoa, Japan, and would you believe it, we even have viewers in Uganda and Kenya. Fijians all over the world are tuning in. Whichever corner of the world you are watching SSD from, welcome to episode 38. We will shortly meet our chief guest, distinguished professor Stephen Rotuva, Director, Macmillan Brown Centre for Pacific Studies, Fellow, Royal Society for New Zealand, the Aparangi University of Canterbury. We will discuss with our chief guest what he means by democratic gerrymandering and how this affects Fiji. We will also talk about the racism narrative, look at what happens when mathematics is factored into politics, discuss affirmative action, and the conflict therein, weigh in on the debate about Fiji and its neighbours, analyse the powers of the brain versus the muscle, as well as discuss what the good professor's projections are for General Elections 22. All that, plus a whole lot more with our chief guest, distinguished professor Stephen Rotuva. I hope wherever you are, you are well settled in to enjoy what promises to be a captivating, engaging, and enlightening interview with my chief guest. As always, I request that today, as we go right around the world by the wonders of Facebook Live and by YouTube, that you please share and like the SSTP page, share on your own timelines, so that we may share this interview with as many interested people as possible. If you share this live feed on your timeline, all your friends and relatives will be able to watch this program. Welcome to the Thinking People's Program, Sashi Singh's Talking Point, live on Facebook and YouTube. Let us begin today's episode 38 as we always do, that is by having a quick look at the main stories from Fiji and Australia in terms of the political week. Firstly, news from Fiji. The Fiji Times reported that the contempt of court proceedings filed by the Attorney General against Suva lawyer Richard Naidu was back in the High Court last week to deal with the Fiji Law Society's application to intervene in the matter. The Attorney General's lawyer, Gul Fatima, was asked by Adish Narain, the Fiji Law Society's lawyer, what is so offensive about the Fiji Law Society intervening in the contempt of court proceedings against Richard Naidu. Is it because, perhaps, they have some other motives here? This was in response to Gul Fatima's submissions during the hearing of the Fiji Law Society's intervener application in the High Court last week. Mr. Narain told the High Court that the Fiji Law Society was intervening in the public interest and would be independent and will not end up in the war between the parties. High Court Judge Nanayakra asked Mr. Narain why the Fiji Law Society didn't intervene in previous contempt of court proceedings, including that of lawyer Aman Ravindra Singh. Mr. Narain replied that the Fiji Law Society had the right to intervene in such matters under the Legal Practitioners Act, and whether it did so or did not, it did not mean it waived its rights to do so. Sticking to court matters, the case against the Speaker of Parliament, the Government and the Attorney General filed by the Fiji Labour Party and Unity Fiji over the electoral laws was called before Chief Justice Kamal Kumar last week. 
Fiji Times reported that lawyer Sevaloni Valinitambua, representing the Fiji Labour Party and the Unity Fiji, told the court that it would be an impossible exercise for aspiring political parties to explain how they would fund financial promises and projects made during campaigning. The amendment to electoral laws requires political parties, politicians, or their agents who make financial commitments to show where funding would come from, how it would be spent, how it would be allocated in different sector and budget sector agencies, and if expenditure exceeded revenue, how the shortfall would be met. Mr. Valeni Tambua said political parties and politicians were neither budget sector nor budget state agencies, and that budgets announced in Parliament were for the sitting government and their agenda. All it does is constrain other political parties from free campaigning, he said. The National Federation Party claimed the government ministers are flouting the rules by effectively campaigning while on official duty, using government resources and manipulating state social media pages to their advantage. The Fiji Times reported that NFP leader Professor Biman Prasad said Fiji had gone into the pre-general election campaign period and it was a shame that government ministers continue to go around the country to hand over assistance to people hiding behind their ministerial portfolios. Professor Prasad said the most important thing is that the election campaign laws are already in effect. The campaign period has kicked in, we are in a campaign mode, and the Attorney General E.R. Sayed Kayum brought this law to specifically target the opposition, so we are subjected to all the campaign laws. They are not because they can hide behind government activities and using government resources and government pages. They are going all over the place in government vehicles, Professor Prasad said. The People's Alliance Party leader, Sitiveni Rambuka, says it is the... Yes, sorry, uh, Sitiveni Rambuka says it is the epitome of self-deception that Prime Minister Vorengimbani Marama and Attorney General E.R. Sayed Kayum convince themselves they are doing marvels for the people and all is well while surrounding themselves with bodyguards. According to a Fiji Times report, Mr. Rambuka questioned the need for the PM and the AG to be consistently ringed by bodyguards and asked, who is fearful of whom? It is impossible for them to admit that fear does exist, as it would show that they have failed to create a happy nation. They have shown that they have created an unhappy nation by having too many people guarding around them. He also claimed that throughout the country, there was a perception that the government was to be feared. Mr. Rambuka claimed so many things they have said and done have driven people to fear them. He claimed the origin of fear went back to numerous publicized incidents and utterances including when Mr. Mbani Marama threatened to withhold development funds to an area that did not support him in the 2018 election. Closer to home, millions of Optus customers woke up last week to the news that their personal data, including their Medicare and passport numbers, had been breached. The Guardian Australia reported that the federal government has demanded Optus pay for new passports for customers caught up in the telco's data breach as the Prime Minister flagged an overhaul of laws relating to the collection of personal information. Foreign Minister Penny Wong has written to Optus raising concerns about criminals exploiting data harvested in the hack, saying there was no justification for victims or taxpayers to foot the bill for replacing compromised documents. And the ABC has reported that for the first time In Australian history, the highest court in the land will be dominated by female justices from the middle of October. Federal Attorney General Mark Dreyfus announced the appointment of Justice Jane Jaggard to the High Court bench on Thursday, replacing the retiring Justice Patrick Keane. Justice Jaggard had been serving in the federal court since 2008 and before that was a judge of the New South Wales Land 
and Environment Court. Susan Kiefel has served as Chief Justice of the High Court since 2017, the first woman to do so. That's a brief look at the news from Fiji and Australia. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point on Facebook Live and YouTube. We ask the questions that Fijians all over the world want answers to, as I say, Fijians want to know. Please like and follow the SSTP page if you have not done so, so far. I have an important announcement to share with our viewers. Sashi Singh's talking point, SSTP recognizes that questioning, constructive arguments, and opinions are part of conversation, but posts with aggressive personal attacks, profanity, name-calling, swearing, defamatory in nature, and or threatening will be removed immediately and offenders will be blocked from being a part of the SSTP program. Let's observe these rules and enjoy the program. Now it is time to meet our chief guest on Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Distinguished Professor Stephen Ratuva is an award-winning interdisciplinary scholar whose research interests and expertise span a number of areas including international relations, political science, sociology, history, development studies, conflict and peace studies, indexology and digitized social control, social protection, affirmative action, globalized knowledge, and the politics of climate emergency. He was the first Pacific person to be appointed distinguished professor, the highest professorial level. He is chair of the International Political Science Association Research Committee on Climate Security and Planetary Politics and was Fulbright Professor at the University of California, LA, Duke University in North Carolina, and, and Georgetown, Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. He was also winner of the University of Canterbury Research Medal winner of the New Zealand Royal Society Medgay Medal for Research Excellence, and was elected as Fellow of the New Zealand Royal Society for International Research Distinction. He is Director of the Macmillan Brown Centre for Pacific Studies at the University of Canterbury and is a New Zealand government appointee in a number of national boards. He leads a number of teams of international experts on global ethnicity development, global security, COVID-19 and social protection and climate security. He has carried out advisory and consultancy roles for a number of international organizations such as United Nations, UNDP, World Bank, International Labour Organization, British Council, International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, Pacific Islands Forum, Commonwealth Secretariat, Asian Development Bank, amongst others. Distinguished Professor Stephen Rotuva was born on the island of Kandavu and is also a musician and artist, and one of his lasting legacies, he says, is the large modern art mural at Lambert Hall, which he painted at the age of 16 years when he was a student at the Maris Brothers High School. It is a depiction of the challenging dilemmas of multiculturalism in Fiji. Wow, what a biodata. With that introduction, it is my pleasure to welcome our chief guest, distinguished Professor Stephen Rotuva, to this live broadcast on Facebook and YouTube, episode 38 of SSTP. Good afternoon, Nisan Bulavinaka, and a big kiora to you, Professor Stephen Rotuva. Oh, Bulavinaka, namaste, and kiora, Sashi, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. And uh, uh, that's a nice backdrop you have there. Let me begin by asking you, that looks uh, like a part of the Fiji Islands. Don't tell me it's the South Island of New Zealand. Uh, yeah, w w when I went to Fiji in 2017, back to my village, I uh, took photos everywhere. And that's one of the photos I took. It's taken from uh, our land, from the mountain, it goes straight to the sea. And behind me is my village, which you can see there, and uh, Ono Island on the other side, and Suva is just directly in front. 
if you draw a line directly from Suva to Kandavu, you'll meet um, my, uh, my well, district of Yale, Kandavu. There are about five villages there. And uh, uh, beautiful uh, plants that you see uh, behind. Uh, there's no marijuana plant in my village, maybe in the other villages, but uh, not in mine. <laughs> so we're, we're free of, uh, of that. Well, I wasn't going to go there. I mean, it's becoming the marijuana capital of Fiji. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but let's leave that aside for now. Uh, uh, let me begin, as I usually do, by finding out a lot more about our chief guest. Uh, however, before I do that, I must say that I have known Stephen Rituva uh, from the mid-80s, when he was a teacher at the Suva Grammar School. And in those days, I was with Radio Fiji as an English broadcaster, and I was also the national quiz master. I'm very proud to say, Steve, that you have really, really come a long way from those days. You've done very well. You've excelled with your academic career, and you've reached the pinnacle of your professorial level. Congratulations. What an achievement. Well done, my friend. Oh, thanks, Sashi. All right. Well, as we've heard, um, you were born on the island of Kandavu. Do you have any recollection of your early childhood? Uh, yeah, I mean, life on the island is very, very, uh, um, uh, very simple. And uh, um, uh, the communities are still in the process of uh, transformation in different ways, uh, social, cultural, and economic as well. Uh, a lot of people are moving away from the island to... Uh, uh, to the urban areas, particularly Suva. Suva is just uh, about uh, five hours by boat, but now with the speedboat, it's about two hours or even less. And uh, um, one, one of the things about growing up in the island is that you wake up every morning, you see the horizon, and the horizon has come to define the way I see the world. And uh, when I came to New Zealand, uh, Pacific scholars were looking at their research in terms of using models which they constructed in Auckland or in um, Dunedin or wherever. And a lot of them haven't been to the Pacific, uh, but I told them, but the way in which Pacific people see the world is very different. It's not to do with those Pacific models, it's to do with the horizon, it's to do with the limitlessness of, uh, of the world around you, behind the horizon, there's another one. Yeah, so uh, that's something which uh, uh, I suppose you develop when you're growing up on an island you're surrounded by the sea and you see the sea as something which defines who you are defines the way you should live and the way you see the world and the future as well so yeah uh, that's some of the, one of the things which uh, uh, is still embedded in me growing up in Kandavu. very nice now looking at your background uh, what of your parents what uh, were their backgrounds mom and dad yeah, they were both from Kandavu. They both passed away. Uh, my my dad passed away when he was uh, 80, and my mom passed away when she was 93. No, 94. Yeah, uh, just uh, two years ago. She had the same... Uh, uh, she, she was always telling me that uh, um, she was the same age in the same uh, month, uh, Queen Elizabeth II was born, and mm -hmm. her birthday is also the Queen's birthday. Uh, but uh, I told her that uh, the Queen was going to die earlier, but uh, it was the uh, the other way around. But anyway, uh, they were both uh, uh, from Kandavu, uh, and uh, so they uh, had uh, six children all together, and I'm one of them. All right, and uh, what about your education background? I started off uh, um, my early education in Kandavu, uh, in the Yale District School. I remember I was taught by a uh, um, a Peace Corps volunteer. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a graduate of Yale University. He brought with him uh, the flag of Yale University and pinned it up in front of the class. And uh, so it was quite an interesting comparison, Yale University and Yale District School, <laughs> uh, the same yeah. spelling. 
And then that Please. kind of still sticks with me. And then uh, from Kandavu, I move on uh, to Maris and then USP. And then uh, I went to Sussex and uh, I did my PhD and uh, I took off from there. How does it seem when a, a person from Kandavu, from Fiji, goes overseas and sees the big world out there? What were your experiences like? Well, it's in in some ways you expected to see new things. In some ways you expected uh, the unexpected. And uh, education uh, is all about uh, learning new things as you as you as you move on. And uh, and as the world gets more complicated, more complex, uh, in some ways your education also prepares you for those things which you uh, uh, that you face as things become more complex in your life. And uh, uh, there are a lot of unexpected, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you begin to develop your character, you begin to develop who you are uh, in terms of uh, your intellectual, your political, your cultural understanding of the world uh, and make use of the opportunities around you as you evolve. All right. Uh... Steve, tell me about the mural you painted as a 16-year-old student at the Maris Brothers High School. What inspired you to do that mural? Yeah, the principal at that time, Brother Magella, asked me, Steve, uh, since you are the best artist in the school, I, uh, I was winning all the uh, art prizes and I was drawing cartoons and the school was full of my artwork all over the place. So why don't you do something about that, that wall? Uh, at Lambert Hall, uh, to take away the monotony, uh, just to make sure that uh, future students will see it and maybe learn something from it. Uh, and then uh, I said, okay. So it took me about uh, one week to put my ideas down in pencil. Uh, and uh, I uh, was trying to use um, different techniques. Uh, the technique which I used there uh, was uh, a deconstruction of uh, Picasso's cubism. Uh, if you know Picasso very well, I used to study art uh, in those early days, particularly the European artists. So Picasso was one of my favorites. So uh, I looked across to Bow Street and then I saw this roller, uh, you know, SEC roller uh, trying to flatten the road. And then mm -hmm. that gave me the idea if I can take Picasso, his artwork was based on cubism. And I put it on the road and then I roll it over like that one and then create it into a one dimensional piece of art. Then I can put it up there. Uh, that's where the idea came from. So it's a mix of Picasso and a mix of some traditional Fijian colors. And uh, uh, it's a story about multiculturalism in, in Fiji. It's a story about uh, society as I saw it evolving and some of the tensions uh, which uh, I saw it in those days. So through the eyes of a 16 year old boy, Yes, and uh, when you go back to uh, Suva, when you go back to Myers Brothers High School, how do you feel when you see that on that wall, your mural? Oh, I haven't seen it for some time. I only mm -hmm. seen pictures of it. I hope they haven't. They were going to uh, uh, to cover it uh, with paint and then have something new uh, because they didn't know the hist history behind it. Uh, and then until I explained to them, look, this is what it means. Oh, okay. So it's not just a, a paint, uh, a collection of um, things that are painted on the wall. It's actually a, uh, a painting as such. Because All if right, you good. get rid of it, then you mm -hmm. actually get rid of, get, getting rid of a painting. It's like taking a, a proper painting and destroying it. Absolutely. Steve, what is your earliest memory? Oh, earliest memory. Uh, well, in terms of uh, since I was born. Mm-hmm. I think I still remember a few things from the age of maybe about three yes. or four. One of my earliest memory was, I think I was three years old when I first visited Suva in those days, uh, in, in the 60s. Uh, if you, uh, um, when you visit Suva, it's something else. It's a different world. Uh, it was as if it was not part of Fiji. Uh, you see, um, you know, Kevalang is everywhere. 
uh, then you see something which is totally different from the world that you used to. And I still remember uh, in my mind uh, that, that moment when I got off the wharf. So that was like a big wide world opening up to a young kid from Kandavu. Absolutely, yeah. As director of the Macmillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies at the University of Canterbury, what does your current work entail? Exp uh, well, at the moment, we're expanding. The university itself is going through reform at the moment, expanding in terms of research, in terms of personnel. We're hiring a lot more people. And uh, the vice chancellor is interested in making the, the center becoming much more. Uh, uh, we have a lot of global projects and regional projects as well, and also projects with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other government ministries. Uh, we, um, uh, and in various countries in the Pacific. So, uh, um, uh, and then we, we are going to expand as well. So a lot of the work focus on research, focus on projects, applied policy projects, um, on publication. Uh, we have, uh, about 20 PhD students. When I came here from Auckland University, I was tasked with uh, trying to save the center from disappearing. Uh, it was crisis. It was on the verge of uh, collapsing. So I came to rescue it. So within uh, two years from zero PhD students, uh, we had 20 PhD students uh, over time. So uh, uh, we have a long queue of uh, PhD students who want to join us. And uh, so we have uh, a network with other universities, other research centers around the world. Uh, we are into publication in a big way because there's something which uh, uh, not only the university, but also nationally, uh, the funders uh, want to see as well. Uh, and uh, so uh, in the next, from next year, it's going to be renamed, uh, hopefully, uh, to expand uh, as part of that expansion. Steve, all the very best with uh, the directorship position that you hold at the Macmillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies, wishing you um, the best of uh, wishes there. Uh, have a break, have a drink of water, then we come back uh, to discuss uh, things of importance to Fiji. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, and our chief guest today is distinguished professor Stephen Rituva, Director of the Macmillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies at the University of Canterbury. Please like and share the SSTP page on your own timelines so that as many people as possible can be part of today's broadcast. Steve, let us begin by discussing a number of things that is really pertinent to Fiji as it readies itself to go to the polls this year or perhaps as late as January 2023. You would have noted that uh, during this election period, polling has taken a hiding from the main mouthpiece of the Fiji First Government, the Fiji First Party, the Minister for Elections, etc., etc., etc. If I could begin by asking you, what is the importance of having polls in any election? Thanks so much, Paul. Um... Uh, Sashi, yes, polls is very much part of the modern democratic process of elections. There are a number of reasons why polls are very important. One is uh, uh, how the voters themselves can reflect on where they are in terms of their perceptions, in terms of their choices. And secondly, it's good for political parties as well uh, to be able to determine um, what uh, what is the perception so far in terms of their performance. Uh, and thirdly, it's a much bigger philosophical issue of uh, creating the democratic space for uh, for ideas, whether superficial or not, or whether it's to do with uh, uh, wishful thinking to do with the future and how you can create the space uh, where they can all intersect and engage with each other. So polling, uh, I must make, uh, make it clear that polling is not a prediction for the election results. It is to do with a snapshot of where things are in relation to the performance of political parties as perceived by the participants in the polls. So uh, uh, so, so it should not be seen as a, a biblical truth, but rather uh, just like the weather forecast. Sometimes they say it'll rain, but maybe it won't. 
um, and uh, uh, and of course, when making prediction, it's not an exact science. Like even in science itself, um, the results of uh, of research may or may not uh, be the same as other people who are doing the same, who do the polls, uh, will will provide uh, in many cases uh, different uh, uh, results. Um, uh, depending very much on the methodology they use, depends very much on the circumstances and where they do the polls as well. All right. Now, without getting too technical, please, you just mentioned methodology. What are the different methodologies used to effectively carry out the polls? Well, the standard ones, which I use my researchers everywhere, social researchers everywhere in different countries, there's a kind of consensus that that particular, like, for instance, the uh, 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 when people were criticizing, um, you know, the polls in Fiji, they didn't ask everybody. You, you don't normally, you can't do that. Uh, so usually the, the, uh, uh, the number of people who are, uh, um, who are interviewed would go as far as maybe 1,500 or 1,000 or even just 500. But then there are mechanisms in place just to make sure uh, that you safeguard the, uh, uh, the credibility of the polls. One is to have uh, uh, what they call the margin of error. The margin of error is usually, uh, say, if you have a last one, the margin of error is usually about 2%, uh, sometimes 3%, 1.5%, depending very much on the circumstances. And also, apart from the margin of error, uh, in other words, um, the results can either go up or down by 2 or 3%. Uh, and also, is what they call the uh, the level of confidence. Uh, is it 95%? Is it, it can't be 100%, could be 90%, 95%. So the larger the, uh, the margin of error, usually um, the, uh, um, the, the higher the level of confidence as well. Uh, confidence in the sense that your result has chances of being, uh, you know, being accurate. So different, uh, I mean, some of the polls, like in New Zealand, the polls here are quite, are quite accurate by two or 3%. Um, the current uh, government, um, the last polls held, uh, predicted that they were going to win by about 46, 47%, but they won by 49%. So uh, uh, depends on how it's done. It can be a very good indicator of what might come. Let us look at the Fiji Sun Western Force polls. What were, assuming it has stopped, or if it hasn't, uh, what are its trends? What what are its trends of the polling itself? Uh, yeah, the Fiji Sun uh, uh, Western Force polls is, is is quite interesting because uh, um, the Fiji Sun itself has been doing poll polling since the first election under this particular constitution in 1914. Um, so interestingly, uh, in July, um, the 12th of July, uh, results of the polls as they build up towards the, uh, that particular election, uh, there was a prediction of around 60 to 78%. Uh, I mean, the, uh, that the Fiji first was going to get somewhere between 60 to 78%, but eventually got 60%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it ran for the minimum. The result uh, was very close to the minimum uh, figure which they provided. Uh, just before the 2018 election, um, they had a uh, um, the polling figures were around 60 to 70 percent for the Fiji First, but they got 50.02 percent. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was slightly lower than what uh, the prediction was slightly lower than what the eventually got. And um, so, but this year, the series of polls they were carrying out uh, showed that the Fiji First was around 20 to 30 percent. That's a far cry from the uh, 60 to 78 percent they were given uh, in 2014. And the 60 to 70 percent they were given in 2018, uh, which means that uh, uh, if you if you follow that pattern of prediction, then looks like even if the uh, 
um, um, if, if the uh, um, margin of error is say five to ten percent, which is very very high anyway, uh, for any polls, then looks like the future first will be in trouble, and probably one of the reasons why they wanted to shut it down because uh, uh, it was not in their favor. And that's quite often, often that, that happens <clears throat> in various countries in the world. Uh, in New Zealand, um, the, uh, uh, the polling, uh, I think it was uh, the last election, yeah, the, during the last election, the, uh, the pollsters, they, uh, uh, they showed that the, uh, the, the uh, um, Winston Peters party, the NASA, the recent Peters party um, was doing very, very badly. In fact, they were not going to win any seats. And then he came out very strongly and said that the pollsters were a bunch of voodoo experts. And also he said that the polls were crap polls to, mm. to quote directly from him. But the pollsters were right. He disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, his old party disappeared. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're, when we look at polling, um, as as the polls are conducted, what are its strengths and what are its weaknesses? Uh, the strengths is that it provides you with uh, uh, the the flags, uh, whether the red flag or yellow flag or green flag, at that mm -hmm. time. Uh, uh, if you're not doing well, that provides the political parties the red flag. Okay, you may have to do better than what you're doing at the moment. Um, and if it gives you a green flag, or well, you're going to do very well, sometimes you become complacent. Yeah. Uh, for instance, the Fiji, uh, the, the, uh, um, the, the Fiji First Party was given a, a green flag uh, in the 2018 election. They were going to get 60 to 70 percent, but they only got 50 percent. So, but now they're given the red flag. So it's important for political parties to listen to some of these polls. Okay, there's some of the uh, weaknesses like it's just prediction of what might happen, and the methodology used can impact on uh, um, on the results, and also a way you do it, and how uh, in the circumstances within the political social circumstances within which you you do it, uh, or the reliability of the people you ask, uh, because nowadays uh, because of the use of the digital method, uh, what happens is they uh, uh, they scramble the, the uh, uh, the numbers, telephone numbers, all together in a computer, and then they just randomly pick from here and there. Uh, they they still reckon that it's probably much more reliable that way than the uh, door to door, house house to house, um, you know, uh, polling. Now, when the polls show favorable figures to a ruling party, everything is honky dory. When the polls show figures are down, especially given the last two polls conducted by the Fiji Sun and Western Force polls, it did not show the Fiji First Government in a favorable light. Were you surprised then by the government's intervention and attack on the Fiji Sun Western Force polling? What uh, no, are was, your comments? Yeah. What are your comments on the government's stance? Yeah, I was not surprised at all because of the uh, the pattern of behavior of the Fiji First government in terms of responding to particular circumstances which uh, uh, did not put them in a good light, whether it's to do with the uh, Nico Waikula's case, where they had to change the uh, registration, water registration for women, uh, so that your name has to be uh, what appears in the um, um, in the birth uh, certificate uh, and, the, um, and the funding, um, you know, uh, legislations and the, to do with election and a whole lot of other things as well. So uh, um, because election is very, very important for the party in power and uh, any party in power would do everything possible within the means, whether it's legal, extra legal uh, to do that. And that's been the story throughout the world. And certainly in the case of Fiji, so I was, wasn't surprised at all because uh, um, it will not be a good look uh, for them. Uh, it will be something uh, which will reverberate uh, in negative ways uh, in terms of the imagery it gives out. And they wouldn't like to have that happen just before the election. 
just want to ask you uh, whether you believe, uh, your opinion, what is it, whether you believe that the polling results has something to do with the delays in issuing the writ uh, of elections. What do you think? Well, one, one can only assume, one can only assume at this point in time, because uh, uh, while, uh, as in the case of Winston Peters, when Winston Peters said that, um, you know, to use his word, polling is crap. Uh, mm. But at the same time, inside himself, he knew, he felt, he understood, um, he trusted, <laughs> Uh, he had a sense of sometimes you don't in a subconscious way uh, that appeals to you oh gosh am i in trouble uh, but on the surface he wants to appear tough um, and uh, uh, some people are making that conclusion as well in the case of fiji so perhaps uh, um, one of the reasons why there's a delay because uh, uh, many countries in the world what they do is that they de delay elections for all kinds of reasons and the reasons which will either undermine the ability to win the election or reasons which will help them to win the election. Um, and that delay period is a period when you try to maximize the favor uh, towards you. And then hopefully it will overshadow and undermine a favor towards a particular political party opposing you. Steve, given the sort of numbers revealed in the last two polls, let us hypothetically look at some analytical projections. Now, in the SSTP poster trailer, your speech bubble said, and I quote, with the polls within 20 to 30 percent range, the Fiji First Party will struggle to survive this election, and even if the margin of error is 10 percent, which is very high, they definitely need a partner. But the question is, who is prepared to work with them? End of quote. Please explain what is the basis of this analysis on your part? Well, it was based on the, uh, uh, on the Fiji Sun polls, which came out. They've been having, doing uh, monthly polls, uh, which consistently has been showing that Fiji First has been sitting around 20 to 30 percent until they were shut down. And uh, so, uh, uh, so that's a, uh, uh, which means that if they want to win the election, then they have to need a partner. Uh, not, not just one, maybe two, or even three. Uh, and mm -hmm. the question is, because they have burned all the bridges in terms of engaging with other political parties as partners, uh, and they've created the uh, atmosphere uh, where uh, it's just them, uh, the perception that they will continue to rule and being able to rule on their own. Uh, and uh, so that becomes very, very interesting to see how they begin to strategize in addressing that issue. So, uh, um, so, so that particular uh, analysis were based on, on, on that, uh, that uh, uh, looks like uh, they may need to look for a partner at this point in time, um, just before the election. Now, what are your views on the People's Alliance and the National Federation Party's post-election coalition? You have said that these two parties could face the same problem as the Fiji First Party. Please elaborate on that. Well, again, based on the, 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 uh, um, on the polling results, but I think the, the, People's, uh, the, the People's Alliance and the National Federation Party uh, post-election coalition uh, is a great thing. In fact, uh, it'd be great if they um, uh, expand that space for other potential political parties like the Unity Fiji or Labour Party to join and be great opportunity for a national coalition. Um, and the poll so far, well, uh, before it was shut down, so that the uh, Alliance Party, the People's Alliance Party, National Federation Party are doing very, very well um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, in the uh, one could actually make an assumption that uh, they're destined to be um, part of the next government, whether on their own, when they suddenly um, things may happen, uh, you know, uh, from now until the next election, they probably need a third, fourth, or you no know, partner. But suddenly, uh, I think in terms of, so it's not just uh, a matter of the technical process of, uh, 
of, of uh, mobilizing votes and winning the election. I think in the bigger issue of uh, national unity and the bigger issue of uh, re-situating Fiji's democracy where it should belong, and that is to do with multi-party, uh, multi-community uh, governance and rule, it's a great opportunity, like I said earlier, for national coalition of all the parties, uh, uh, the smaller parties who uh, uh, who are able to win the seats, who are able to get over the 5% threshold. Uh, the, the Alliance Party, um, the National Federation Party, and perhaps the Nas Fiji Nas Unity Party, the Labour Party, uh, and uh, uh, that's probably the, the three which have uh, uh, good chances at the moment of winning uh, seats. Steve, I'll come back in a moment and I'll talk about possible coalition partners. But before that, given that there are about 10 parties contesting the elections, what are your thoughts on these smaller parties? Is a vote for these parties a wasted vote? Um, some political pundits have said that if you vote for a smaller party, you're just wasting your vote. Uh, what are your views on that? Yeah, the term wasted vote has been bended around for some time, particularly for my bigger political parties, who probably think that certain votes should have gone in their direction. But perhaps from the point of view of the mathematics of uh, voting, uh, in terms of uh, votes counting towards changing the government, uh, towards making transformation in the political process, uh, this probably can be perceived as wasted. Mm -hmm. But if you look at it from the point of view of political rights and uh, and democratic rights of voters, then there's no such thing, no such thing as a wasted vote anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, people have the right either to vote or not to vote. Uh, for instance, um, uh, because not voting is actually a vote in itself. It impacts on the results. And people make deliberate decisions sometimes not to vote, like in Russia at the moment. A lot of people don't want to join the army. They are voting with their feet. They're running away. Uh, they don't want to be uh, uh, involved in that. In a lot of elections everywhere in the world, uh, they argue that young people and a lot of uh, uh, particularly young people are not interested to vote. But the fact that they are not voting uh, it's also a vote in itself because uh, it impacts on the on the results of the election. So when you refer to somebody casting a wasted vote, you're actually insulting the person saying, hey, hey, you wasted, you are useless. <laughs> uh, when in fact they have made up their mind to vote for somebody, although that party might lose the election, uh, although that party might uh, take the votes away from another from a big political party which wanted to win, that still doesn't mean that it's wasted. It simply means that the choice of those people, of those wasted vo of, of, uh, wasted votes, uh, has gone have gone somewhere else, but not towards the winning camp. So uh, uh, yeah, we, so we have to be careful when we say wasted vote here. In a purely mathematical and purely technical way, it can be wasted in the sense that. Uh, it has not contributed to, it has taken the votes away from getting rid of someone in power. Uh, but in terms of uh, 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 individual voter right and political right, uh, it's not wasted at all. People have voted uh, and they put their choices um, you know, on paper and whether they win or lose, that's another issue. Well explained. Uh... Uh, very well explained that uh, a vote is not wasted. And uh, I take it in this instance, as you explain the Russian example, somebody could go into the polling booth and decide not to mark anything on the paper. They're already crossed off uh, uh, as far as attendance is concerned, but they've exercised their right not to vote and they've walked away. So mm -hmm. that's that's their prerogative, isn't it? is it not? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I remember when I first voted, uh, I was still a student at USP. I think it, there was 1982 election in Fiji. Uh, the first time I, I voted, I went in there, uh, voting booth. I uh, saw the voting um, papers 
there's supposed to be three or four in those days. And I look at the political parties, I look at, um, you know, the candidates, I said, I don't think I like any of these people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, if I can remember, I think I left it blank. <laughs> so it was also a vote. A blank vote is, was also a vote. Yeah. Steve, given that we have discussed uh, the bigger political parties, that they may not have sufficient numbers of votes to govern outright, and uh, given the current scenario, you've just said a little while ago that uh, according to the last two polls, Fiji first may not be able to govern outright. You've also espoused your theory that uh, the People's Alliance and the National Federation Party may not have sufficient numbers to govern outright. Given those scenarios, who do you think is going to be the kingmaker partner? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the term king, kingmaker itself is problematic in different ways. First of all, it's a mm -hmm. sexist term. <laughs> uh, you don't want to make king nowadays. Also queens, also uh, um, um, say leaders, uh, the leader maker, let's put it that way. Uh, right. But the term has been around in political science for a long time. Anyway, it's, it's not your fault. It's somebody else's fault. Uh, but anyway, um, yeah. Um, so it's a uh, no. It's difficult to to to, uh, to make a uh, um, um, you know a prediction on that because because um, um, if if you have a uh, if you decide on a coalition, if all the parties come together and all of them contribute to creating the new leader, creating the new leader, it's not just one of them. Um, so, but sometimes the term kingmaker is normally used when uh, uh, you just need one or two, you know, seats. Uh, you add, then you become one, uh, and the person come, coming in will become very, very powerful, uh, in the sense that uh, because um, the the new party or the new politician or politicians who come in uh, to be able to form the government. They're able to uh, hold the government at ransom. Sometimes the so-called king maker, king makers. Uh, it happens a lot in countries like uh, Vanuatu and Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea, uh, where they have fractures all over the place. Different political parties they come together after the election to form the government, and somebody withdraws and the whole thing collapses, and then they form another one. So they're waiting for they try to grab in a party from there as the so-called king maker uh, to form a new government. Uh, they try to put together legislations to avoid that. Uh, uh, Samoa and Cook Islands, they managed to avoid that um, uh, through legislation, but uh, but not in Papua New Guinea. So, uh, um, so yeah, uh, in the case of Fiji, uh, any one of those can be, uh, let's say, Unity Fiji, for instance, if uh, the People's Alliance and the National Federation Party uh, looking for an extra one or two partners, and then the most natural ones would be the uh, Unity Fiji and the Labour Party, uh, and they become and they play that role as uh, you know so-called kingmakers. But okay, like I said no. earlier, like I said earlier, it's a great opportunity for uh, for national coalition, and each and every one of them uh, should not be seen as kingmaker, but rather collectively as contributing to creating a unified political um, front. All right. You've, you've mentioned, uh, as an example, the Unity Fiji Party. Uh, as you know, the Unity Fiji Party, under the leadership of Savinada Narumbe, has stated in the past that they do not want to work with coup leaders. What do you think their stance will be if they ultimately hold the balance of power and uh, a shift either to Fiji First or the People's Alliance in NFP will form government, noting that both sides have a former coup leader. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's an interesting uh, uh, statement there by my Tavu and friend, uh, Mr. Narumbe. Uh, there was uh, some time ago, I think it was last year. So things may have changed since then. Uh, but... Uh, uh, but in relation to the statement whether one can work with a coup leader, uh, in some ways Fiji is very, very small. 
And in some ways, everybody's been tainted in some, you know, either directly or indirectly by the coups. And uh, there have been uh, three coups altogether. And uh, um, um, a, uh, a, a British uh, uh, politician once said that in politics, it's not what is good, it is what works. In, in other words, um, one may have moral perceptions about the world, uh, but the purity of political action and thinking, when in fact, the realities of uh, politics is such that one may have to adapt to it in ways which, uh, uh, which demand uh, that one should uh, perhaps uh, be much more um, practical um, rather than relying too much on uh, ideology. So, yeah, um, in terms of the circumstances, um, you know, uh, in the post-coup, sorry, in the post-election scenario, uh, where the three or four parties may have to come together, um, I think it's important that all the parties, uh, Narumbis Party and Nas National Federation Party, the People's Alliance, uh, or even the Labour Party, can be part of the new government because uh, I suppose uh, in this particular case there is a uh, they're all fighting against a single if you like uh, adversary which is Fiji first and what normally unites uh, political groups and individuals uh, despite the differences uh, it's not so much ideology but the fact that they share a common adversary and that happens a lot in uh, wherever, uh, whether it's New Zealand, it happens here. At, at some point, uh, there was a coalition between the National Party, which is very right wing, and the Maori Party. And that was seen as a no no. Uh, just because, for strategic reasons, for pragmatic reasons, they had to do it. Um, and the same thing with the New Zealand First and the Labour Party, they had a coalition. So uh, I think it's important that in the practicality of politics, uh, the fact that Fiji needs a new, if you like, uh, conglomeration of political forces binding together to redefine the future, uh, that uh, uh, specific ideas about ideology uh, can be overcome and overshadowed by the need for unity. Now, that's interesting you say that, uh, because I did raise the question about the two former coup leaders. Now, is it going to be for the common good, for a common good of Fiji, for Sava Narumbe to make that ultimate choice? He has, I must add, as late as Friday, called for the opposition parties to unite, if uh, for nothing else, than to mount a legal challenge and lodge complaints to the elections office. So he's sort of nibbling at it, he's calling for unity, but uh, should it be for the common good of Fiji? That differences are put aside, that uh, personal views are put aside, as you say, for, for a strategic alliance. Oh yes, of course, uh, Narum is a very smart, very uh, good-hearted person, uh, empathetic and uh, um, uh, with a lot of experience, and I'm sure that he understands that. And I think he uh, embraces the fact that uh, for the good of uh, the country, for the greater good, uh, it's important for the various uh, political groups to come together. Important question at this juncture as Fiji heads towards general elections 2022. Whilst uh, we can sit and talk about post-election coalitions uh, and... Uh, the question is this, do you think that the opposition parties should announce the intended coalition partnerships before the actual elections so that the voting public know precisely how their votes will shape the outcome of the elections? People's Alliance and the National Federation have already announced that. If uh, other parties are to join that coalition, do you think it should happen here and now before the actual voting? So people know who their votes, uh, how their votes are going to fall. Yeah, again, um, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the political parties are trying, are struggling at the moment 
to adapt to the constitutional requirements which are there, which uh, which uh, which limits your ability to form coalitions. You can only form coalitions under this particular constitution after the uh, um, after the elections, not before that. Uh, the most that they can do is to have um, broad agreements uh, that after the election that they can come together. So, uh, um, um, so I mean, there's there's no harm. I think already people, I think the public already know that political parties are talking. It's been going on for some time since last year. Um, uh, there have been challenges here and there. Um, some um, alliances have uh, emerged and and disappeared. Uh, but I think in a broad sense, as the election gets uh, closer and closer, and as the democratic space for political parties to engage uh, is closed, you know, in different ways, whether it's to do with uh, the new electoral legislations and so forth, uh, that is beginning to get them to see uh, their chances uh, fundamentally along the lines of formation of coalitions afterwards. The National Federation Party and the Alliance Party have already uh, officially um, uh, put together a coalition partnership, not now, but later. Uh, at the moment, I think they're going to work together. Uh, the other political parties, uh, in a more informal manner, they're probably also uh, talking uh, with the, the two parties. And uh, uh, and I'm not surprised if uh, those will become much more formalized after the election. Now, Steve, in the early polling uh, that was conducted by the Fiji Sun and Western Force pollsters, the popularity rating for the incumbent government dropped to as low as 22%. What do you attribute such low numbers to? Yeah, as you're reading out the question, I'm thinking about New Zealand as well. Uh, the mm -hmm. popularity of uh, Jacinda is going down, 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 down all the time. Uh, from the Labour Party uh, with 49% when they won the election to now they're around 30. In fact, they won't be able to, to rule uh, if the latest polls are going to be um, manifested in the in the incoming election, which is next year, I think. Now, a couple of things. One is to do with, uh, um, despite the popularity of a particular government in power, um, the, the voters, just human psychology, where people begin to feel a sense of, oh, yes, they've been in power. So, yes, we've experienced it. Um, so the novelty when they first came in is slowly disappearing, is withering away. Uh, and people in politics are very, very impatient, particularly the voters. Um, they want things quickly. They want things done. And if you've been in power for a long time, then you begin to lose that, that mana, begin to lose that sense of, uh, uh, of almost like divineness, uh, which... Uh, you impress the people uh, in the first place on, and uh, that's why they voted for you. So that's one to do with the loss of appetite and the loss of uh, of appeal of a party in power if it's in power for too long. Uh, it happens everywhere all the time. And secondly, uh, I think it's to do with uh, the strength of the opposition parties uh, emerging, and they've been able to chew off certain bits of the appeal of Fiji First Party. And thirdly, uh, is to do with human agency, is to do with people themselves being able uh, to see what's happening around the world and then begin to see what's happening in Fiji and then they realize that probably, we probably need a better future than where we are at the moment. So, uh, uh, and fourth, related to that, uh, is the fact that a lot of the discussions have gone online because of the limits created by, uh, by um, well, the democratic limits of discussions on the ground. So they've gone online. And that's where uh, uh, and people begin to feel that the limitations which are imposed by the current government in terms of things like the media uh, and uh, uh, protests and public expressions uh, because of the draconian legislations 
such as the Public Order Act, for instance, uh, beginning to and you take away people's voices and people's ability to be able to express themselves fully. So all those things are uh, taking their toll on the current government uh, in terms of uh, uh, its ability to impress upon the population of Fiji that they are here for a long time. And do you think that uh, issues such as the rising debt levels, the uh, escalating uh, poverty in Fiji, people are on Struggle Street. Do you think after 16 years of uh, Mimbani Marama government that this has also contributed to the low numbers as shown in the polls for support for the Fiji First Party? Oh, yes, of course, of course, yeah. Uh, that's certainly the case. Um, yeah, the, uh, um, I, I mentioned that those things, uh, you know, uh, indirectly, the debt level has been part of the public discussion and people know about it. And it's one of the uh, uh, the worst in the Pacific. And certainly um, it's right up there amongst the, uh, the leading debtors in the world. And uh, uh, the rising poverty, uh, the uh, people's feeling of insecurity, the rising crime and all those things. Um, and of course, COVID came in uh, and did some of the damage as well, like in the case of New Zealand here. In fact, a lot of the governments in power during the COVID period are struggling uh, to be able to uh, rehabilitate the economies, rehabilitate their societies after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Let me just come back uh, to what I was discussing regarding an alternative government uh, that is uh, opposition parties who can work together. Last week, my chief guest was uh, Mick Beddows, and uh, Mick uh, announced in my program that he was going to be putting his name forward as a candidate for the Unity Fiji Party. Now, uh, Mick, of course, has been around. He's been the leader of the opposition in the past. And uh, do you think that uh, Mr. Narumbe and Mr. Beddows should make the intentions known right now that they will align with the People's Alliance and the National Federation Party to form a, a credible alternative government for Fiji so that the people have a direct, or rather people have uh, a, a absolute knowledge of this, uh, that uh, this is the credibility that we will get, this is the credible alternative government that we will get. How important is that? That's what I'm trying to drive at. It's easy to talk about unity, but that announcement, do you think that is absolutely important? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, of course, of course. Uh, that's very important for a number of reasons. One is that uh, uh, it makes a direct appeal to the people. This is the alternative and people will be able to make their choices directly, uh, perhaps at the moment, because uh, uh, this uncertainty in terms of what the alternative government looks like, then uh, um, it may not, uh, you know, uh, go down well uh, in terms of election coming. So having that, if you like, direct engagement with the people and telling them, look, this is what is going to happen. These are the three or four parties. Uh, which have been talking and um, um, in the post-election period will be able to form a government. So certainty is, um, is something which uh, um, the people need. Certainty is something which uh, will be in their favor. Certainty is something which uh, uh, will be able to uh, to give Fiji First a, uh, a fair opposition uh, in terms of the new election. Uh, and that, and certainly, um, certainty is something which uh, our voters need in terms of uh, making up their mind early at this point in time, as the time, as the clock ticks and ticks and ticks and comes closer to the election time. You see, the reason I raise that with you, Steve, is that uh, if that intention is made prior to the elections. The understanding, for instance, the People's Alliance and the National Feder uh, and the National Federation Party have a memorandum of understanding, and under that MOU, they have uh, uh, left options for other parties to join them. 
what this will do is that it will stop horse trading after the elections. That if there is this intended coalition of the People's Alliance, the Federation Party, the uh, Unity Fiji Party, the general public know these three parties are together. There will not be any horse trading when it comes to these three parties altogether. Um, how important is that? I mean, to avoid horse trading and being influenced after the election. Yeah, horse trading is uh, sometimes it's, uh, can be counterproductive, especially after the elections. So you're right. It's very important that uh, there's certainty, uh, there's an agreement, uh, even between, uh, well, before the election. Uh, there's provision there in the memorandum of understanding between the National Federation Party and the Alliance Party for other parties to join it, which is great uh, in terms of providing the space for expanding the boundary, expanding the partnership uh, and the collaboration between political parties. And of course, uh, uh, as the election comes closer, uh, that provision can be, uh, that new re-engagement with political parties can be made public uh, to be part of a broader um, platform for electoral uh, campaigning. As we know, the polls, the Fiji Sun and the Western Force polls, uh, uh, let's use the word suspended. They've been suspended for now. Is there an, any disadvantage when there is no consistent polling being conducted in Fiji prior to elections, and if it is a disadvantage, who is at a disadvantage? Is it the voting public or political parties or both? No, everybody's disadvantaged. Uh, the government is at a disadvantage because they are uh, going around in the dark themselves. Political parties are at a disadvantage. The voters are at a disadvantage. And one of the... Uh, uh, the uh, um, the things about the the electoral act, uh, which uh, uh, um, uh, to do with uh, the polls and research, is that it gives a lot of power to the electoral commission to determine the kinds of polling method to be used, and also the research to be done on the election. Uh, never heard that in any country in the world. So, in other words the Electoral Commission has become an intellectual police, almost similar to the moral police in Iraq, uh, which has led to the uh, riots and all those things. Uh, that's quite a significant, in fact, a terrible uh, blow to uh, intellectual freedom in this country. And uh, um, um, at a time when uh, we need more discussions and more critical debates around governance and around democracy and other issues, they're trying to shut down research. They're trying to shut down opinion polls um, in a way which uh, is not good for democracy. In other countries in the world, the, uh, the bodies which regulate the polling is not the Electoral Commission. It's not the government, um, except uh, for Singapore, uh, where, which is very authoritarian anyway. But rather, it is the professional bodies of research, <clears throat> like in New Zealand here, the research uh, body here. Um, not tells researchers what to do, but rather provides a guideline and says, look, uh, these are the guidelines you must use. Make sure that it's professional. Make sure that it's trustworthy. It's reliable uh, for the public. Um, but it's not, it's not imposed. Uh, it's, it's not legally framed in a way that you criminalize those uh, who don't follow it, which happens to be the case in Fiji. Steve, how important is it for the people of Fiji in terms of this election to be engaged in the democratic process of providing their views on who they want to govern them? I mean, polling was one, one particular way they could engage themselves, but there's also other ways. Oh, yes. Uh, polling is one. Research is one as well. But then that too is being controlled. So if you are an academic or you know somebody who wants to do research then you have to get permission from the uh, make sure that you follow the guidelines provided by the uh, um, by the uh, uh, electoral commission now uh, and of course um, the uh, just open debates um, for instance um, and uh, being able to uh, 
speak uh, freely. And what has happened in the last few years is that people are very careful who to speak to and what they say. Uh, there's suspicion throughout, there's a sense of fear. So fear is a very powerful tool of control. So fear is a very significant factor in determining the shape and the size of the democratic space. If you plant um, minefields of fear in the community, then uh, uh, that will impact on people's consciousness and on the culture um, uh, to be able to, to express and to engage with each other. Um, certainly, if you look at, if you plot the, uh, the, the, if you like, the history of democracy in Fiji, uh, we, we probably at the level, because democracy is not just defined in terms of being able to vote, uh, the electoral democracy, as they call it. Uh, democracy is much more than that. Um, it's not just a nice constitutional piece of paper. It's not just a beautiful separation of powers and how it looks, uh, you know. Uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, uh, the, the the documents where, where it's written, it has to do with lived experiences. It has to do with uh, how people are able to express themselves freely and fully in the context of their social and political um, realities which they live through. So, uh, um, so as the election comes closer, I think it's. In, uh, we, we kind of realized that uh, like polls and research being shut down. So, and thus the, the dem democratic space for discussion as well is pretty limited. I will come back in a short while to talk about the democratic space that you talk about. Before that, um, conflict of interest, uh, powers. Let me talk about it. Uh, the, the additional powers given to the supervisor of elections, um, this seems that uh, powers have been enacted in law that uh, a person can go on a witch hunt if the person so chooses. And uh, th these are all uh, aiming at uh, draconian measures to uh, somehow silence opposition parties. Would you like to render any thought on that? Uh, yeah, uh, we have to look at the different contexts within which, uh, which um, where all these things operate. Uh, from the point of view of those who enact these laws, uh, they're actually meant to protect certain interests which they have under the guise, of course, of stability. Um, governments are very good in using nice sounding rhetoric such as security, stability, rule of law, law and order, um, and and so forth as a means of justifying particular uh, rules or legislations which they want to put in place. But uh, the real reasons are often hidden behind the, uh, uh, the laws themselves. And the reasons can be very political, can be ideological, uh, can be economic, uh, and, uh, and they can also be determined by uh, particular individuals or groups behind the scene. The uh, famous American um, scholar, uh, Noam Chomsky, I'm sure you must have heard of him. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, talks about different levels of narratives. Uh, one is the public narrative that you create to make sure that people listen to and believe. And then, then you use that to hide another layer of narrative which is your true intention, which you don't want to talk about. And when people stage coups, for instance, in Fiji, uh, they will use the public narrative for, use for this particular purpose, whether it's to do with, uh, usually for a good purpose, but usually it hides the, uh, the real reason for that. And that happens in elections as well. Uh, if you make laws, uh, in, the, in the case of the United States, you have these big corporations who are behind the scene, uh, who are manipulating the circumstances so that legislations and a lot, of, a lot of things can happen. So uh, yeah, some of the uh, what we got to be looking at, uh, on one hand, those who make the uh, uh, those laws and legislations, uh, who's behind it? And what are the real interests behind it uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, having that to come about? Is it to do with uh, sustenance of the perpetual rule? And on the other hand, who is it targeted towards? 
uh, what is it what is the intended impact if the intended impact is to minimize the ability to generate votes generate support from the community uh, that's one is there the intention to make sure uh, that uh, um, that you cast them as criminals because some of these laws what they do is that they criminalize the behavior of particular people uh, in such a way so that they are not eligible uh, to stand for election so uh, so it's a lot of intersection there between the underlying motives and secondly uh, it's the criminalization of particular kinds of behavior uh, and thirdly how to sustain the interests of those who make those laws not so much for national interest but sometimes in fact in many cases it's usually for the interests of those who came up with the legislations in the first place have a break uh, have a drink of water we'll come back and we'll discuss uh, democracy in fiji as you say uh, the democratic space i guess we'll find out more you are watching sashi singh's talking point and our chief guest today is distinguished professor Stephen Rotuva and the director of the Macmillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies at the University of Canterbury. Please like and follow the SSTP page so that as many people can view today's episode. And there are a few people sending stars to SSTP. Well, thank you very much for that as well. Sincerely appreciated. Steve, let us now shift our discussions to the topic of democracy. As we know and understand, democracy is a form of government in which the people have the authority to deliberate and decide legislation. That's direct democracy. Or to choose governing officials to do so, which is representative democracy. Now, you have written about a new style of democracy. What do you mean by democratic gerrymandering? And how does this affect Fiji? Uh, yeah, the term gerrymandering is, has a very interesting history uh, in the United States, where uh, the, uh, in 1812, the Boston governor wanted to reconfigure the electoral boundaries to suit him. So uh, his name was Eldridge Gary, Jerry. So it became it referred to as Jerry, and mandarin comes from the term salamander. Salamander is, of course, the animal it looks like a lizard. Mm. So when they eventually looked at the uh, the new boundaries they realized that it had the form of a salamander looked like salamander so they just put the two together jerry and salamander uh, gerrymandering um, so it, it started off uh, in, in in the area of political um, science as uh, um, trying to reconfigure the boundaries so that it suits you uh, the republicans in the united states are doing that uh, in their various states they're trying to change the boundaries, making sure that the Democrats don't win the next elections, the local mm -hmm. elections. Um, and a lot of countries in the world, they do that in very, very subtle ways. So the term has been used to expand from just the boundaries to looking at various legislations, how you change the legislation, how you change the, uh, the, uh, the various institutional norms and structures and processes which will suit you. In the election everyone in power if you are a government in power your first and foremost uh, aim is to stay in power uh, you do anything possible to do that because that's your money uh, a lot of politicians a lot of ministers they have nowhere else to go anyway uh, they are a lot of them are unemployable <laughs> so there's the only employment they will ever know so that's uh, uh, so so so, so the, the, the term has been used, uh, the expanded definition of gerrymandering from purely playing around with, with boundaries uh, for, the, for the specific purpose of making sure that you are able to, uh, to win the election. Um, you know, you change the boundaries so that people who are loyal to you can be within that boundary. To also mean making legislative changes uh, in ways which uh, will favor you. So uh, either uh, which favors those in power, those who are creating the legislations, or will undermine the favor, or will 
not work favorably for those who are in opposition. So it works both ways. It favors you while it doesn't favor the opposition. So that's a kind of uh, expanded definition of uh, gerrymandering. So in other words, the uh, Electoral Act uh, where opposition parties have to provide all sorts of costing, etc., for their policies, is that also gerrymandering? Well, if you make life difficult for the opposition for no reason, mm -hmm. then simply to control them uh, and centralize authority of uh, almost everything that you do. Um, although political parties are supposed to be independent, they can do whatever. Okay, they're, they're, they're broader. Um, um, uh, rules which they have to follow, but if it's, if it's too specific and becomes um, uh, begins to be interpreted as being an attempt to, to weaken you and your ability to fight the election, that becomes part of the mandarin, gerrymandering normative process or institutional process of, of gerrymandering. You have stated that there is a need for opening up space for democracy. However, all examples in Fiji point to there being a systematic limiting of democratic space using legal means. What did you mean by the concept of opening up space for democracy? Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about democracy, uh, open up, see the um, if, 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 you define demo, if you define democracy purely in legal terms, then this, that becomes very problematic because laws will de define what it is for you, where in fact democracy should be defined by the people's will to engage, should be defined by the uh, idea of sharing your sense of freedom and your sense of free expression. And the laws must be used um, to guide rather than to limit uh, these forms of free expression. I think what we're doing at the moment is that we are creating little uh, legal bubbles and you know, put people in inside. Uh, the different ways to create laws uh, is, is a lawyer yourself. Jurisprudence is a very complex issue. You have an intersection between politics, ideology, culture, and legality. Uh, uh, sometimes if you put legality at the center, that becomes very problematic for people. Uh, you got to put people in the middle and then legality should be a way of enhancing uh, the sense of freedom rather than curtailing the sense of freedom. Uh, but then, of course, there are limits to that. And the limits have to be defined in law as well, but uh, but in the context of uh, uh, the, the consequences of people's action on each other. If through uh, freedom of action, you step on people's toes, and that's where the law should come in and say, hang on, uh, how do you make sure that you don't step on other people's toes? Um, so uh, yeah, so it, so that's that, that's where we should think very very carefully, particularly as as Fiji uh, evolves uh, its democracy uh, and how uh, the law is used. Uh, the law is used to facilitate rather than to limit and oppress. Given the Fiji context, can you provide examples of how democratic space is being limited using legal means? I mean the media, uh, the media acts. For instance, uh, at the moment, the uh, the media in Fiji they are going through the process of self um, self editing, of uh, self control, of uh, you know, um, uh, just to make sure they don't get into trouble. Uh, once uh, the media people start thinking in terms of being fearful of the consequences of uh, what they write and what they say, then there's a big trouble there. Big, there's a big problem there because the media is one of the biggest uh, pillars of, uh, of democracy and democratic expression um, uh, in the modern world. Uh, that, that, that's, that's one, and certainly the Public Order Act, uh, which um, um, uh, it is actually a colonial, um, you know, residue of colonialism, which has been around, was used by the colonial state, particularly the British, to suppress any anti-colonial activity or any activity which they smell and which is suspected of being uh, anti-colonial in those days. Um, uh, and of course, some of the electoral legislation, some of these things have to be looked at as well. 
uh, is to, in, in terms of um, uh, being limiting. So, uh, um, yeah, I had a, um, um, yes, yeah, so, so, some, somebody was telling me uh, that he, uh, um, um, yeah, he, he was in Fiji recently um, to do research when he came back, um, you know, uh, the police were asking for him for no reason whatsoever. He, he just went to his village, uh, basically, uh, you know, to do a, um, well, it's an annual visit he does. And then, uh, but because he was uh, seen to be an academic from overseas, uh, he was suspected of being involved in something. So those kinds of suspicion, those kinds of stereotyping of people, when they begin to build up the sense of fear in people, and then you get the police, uh, to be involved and you get the law to be involved. It takes away that sense of, uh, of, of free engagement, that sense of being, uh, of identity of a country, of being able to do things that you're supposed to have uh, been able to do. Uh, and and, and then if, if you ask uh, people in their like 60s or 70s now, even 80s, and see how have your own experience in Fiji, how have they evolved in terms of your ability to say things freely, uh, from now, uh, from the past until now, they would probably tell you the story of how things have changed over the years. You mentioned the media. Do you think it is a sad indictment uh, that uh, there are certain media in Fiji that uh, rather than sub-editors and editors having the final say on a uh, news story, that uh, they have to refer opinion pieces, etc., to their lawyers, and the lawyers ultimately have the final say. Uh, in the old days, editors used to have the final say. Your thoughts? Uh, yes, of course. As you know, you were a journalist at some point. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was uh, uh, the height of uh, media freedom in, in Fiji. Uh, I was. used to enjoy the, uh, the Radio Fiji programs that you guys created. Uh, JK, a friend of mine who's uh, uh, no longer around, uh, yes. uh, and uh, and uh, and you and a few others. Uh, the heyday of uh, you know the uh, I used to look forward to the uh, uh, current affairs program and the news, which was uh, you know very intellectually enlightening, uh, which was uh, a critical, uh, which you don't see nowadays. Um, you know, the, the intellectual aspect, the critical aspect has disappeared. And that's a, a sad indictment of how things have evolved. Uh, and if you control the, uh, the media, then you control the ability of the public to be able to engage uh, in deeper thoughts and consciousness about who they are and where they are, and certainly in the country. You're not just controlling the media, you're controlling people. You're controlling their, 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 their culture, their lives. Uh, in ways which are very subtle, but very deep, very deep indeed. And that's one of the things which people don't realize. So it's not just a political experiment of social engineering, political engineering, where you uh, make sure that you have a structure in place, and then you, uh, um, and then you limit people's ability to, uh, 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 to express themselves, to fit into, into those structures, legal structures you have created. And but the deeper impact on people's uh, self-consciousness and the degradation of the self-perception um, uh, 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 can be long-lasting. You've brought back you've brought back many memories, uh, Steve, because uh, in those uh, what I call the good old days of broadcasting, um, I remember I was given a free hand. I was one of the first ones to start talkback radio in my morning uh, breakfast shows and uh, that was without any restrictions without uh, guidelines any holdbacks I was free to uh, edit my own show and to present it and to ask whatever questions I wanted to but then of course we had the uh, uh, first coup and it was all over after that let's move on uh, I want to address the abuse of uh, racism narrative with you um, you are on record as saying, and I quote, most modern states segregate data along ethnic lines. 
because of the need to be more proactive towards creating a diverse, equal, and tolerant society. End of quote. You've also said that uh, ethnicity was widely used as a variable for the Household Income and Expenditures Survey, HICE, because there was a general recognition that some ethnic groups were historically more disadvantaged than others. However, the AG said that ethnicity and religious data would not contribute towards Fiji's progress as a nation. Firstly, how has there been abuse of the racism narrative? And secondly, how do you reconcile the AG's stance on this? Yeah, first of all, let me uh, uh, comment on the uh, idea of, uh, of segregate data for ethnic data. Now, there's a difference between, that's what people are confusing. Uh, there's a difference between uh, 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 segregated data, in other words, you have separate data for different ethnic groups, and ethnic segregation. <laughs> They're different things altogether. Uh, in fact, the uh, one of the the policies of governments around the world, including New Zealand, is that the segregated data actually is a way of using that information to build up a united, to build up a much more equitable and much more diverse society. Uh, because uh, to be able to to build an equitable and diverse society, uh, a policy now which is being uh, perpetuated by the United Nations through its uh, SDG, Sustainable Development Goals, um, which Fiji subs subscribes to, uh, that no one is being left behind. And the only way in which you make sure that no one is being left behind is to have information. Now, who's being left behind? So either in terms of their socioeconomic uh, background and some of those they coincide and they intersect with uh, ethnic background of people there's some ethnic groups around the world uh, which as a group they are actually socioeconomically disadvantaged as a group um, so uh, uh, so so in many ways uh, socioeconomic and ethnic intersection is very interesting is very good to look at uh, because uh, uh, like in many countries, like in the world, they, they, they use that. Now, the second question on uh, on racism. Racism is uh, is one of those terms which is uh, has been used, and in fact, um, some people uh, overuse it to the extent that it begins to lose its meaning. Um, because uh, originally, the term racism, uh, the way in which uh, uh, it evolved from especially the European racism of the uh, last few centuries, starting with uh, the period of what is generally known as the uh, Enlightenment, when the idea of uh, of scientific racism came into place. There's certain people who are uh, biologically and intellectually inferior by nature, uh, and uh, uh, particularly the non-whites. Now, um, over the years, it has been used in different ways to mean different things. And nowadays it's used by some people uh, to cast some people as racist uh, just because they don't like what they say. Or they say things which have to do with a particular ethnic group which they don't like. Uh, and uh, that has been happening in Fiji for, for some time uh, in the way in which... Uh, uh, the term has been used to cast somebody as being, in a very political way, uh, to cast somebody you don't like, uh, and then as being evil, as being um, of not somebody who works in the national interest, because if you're cast as a racist, then uh, you, uh, it's almost like the end of the world for you, because you are, um, you know, the worst of the worst in society. It has built up that that the connotation uh, in Fiji over the years, uh, and then is used liberally every now and then. Uh, people calling each other that uh, for maybe for something they say, uh, maybe they didn't mean it, and maybe they meant something else. But then it's interpreted in a particular way, and then cast within that box of racism. All right. Now, what about the AG who said that uh, 
ethnicity and religious data would not contribute towards Fiji's progress as a nation. Um, how do you reconcile his stance on this? See, many other countries in the world are actually doing the opposite. Because to be able to move forward as a nation uh, in terms of development and in terms of because development, national unity, uh, diversity and equity, they all go together. You can't just have development as a mechanical economic exercise. It has to be linked to human human beings, has to be linked to people's uh, uh, well-being, has to be linked to equity, has to be linked to diversity. Uh, the UNDP, the, the uh, SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal itself talks about that. So they have to be part of the whole package because you have to respect the identity of people. You have to, whether it's religious or whether it's, uh, uh, or whether it's uh, uh, cultural or whether it's uh, ethnic. Uh, and that respect is very much embedded in the SDG um, framing of, uh, of, uh, of communities. Uh, which Fiji uh, subscribed to, and uh, um, so there's uh, um, so there's a lot there in terms of uh, how the Fiji will need to rethink about its uh, uh, all this uh, the, the linkages between development uh, and people's social background. When they did uh, increasingly, uh, not only countries are beginning to look at diversity and and and, uh, and equity. Uh, uh, as important for economic development and also for for stability, even corporate organisations have done a lot of research. Uh, they realise that corporate boards are much more efficient when you have more diversity in it, in terms of gender, in terms of culture, in terms of professionalism, uh, in terms of uh, different aspects of uh, people's lives altogether, because they bring different things. That diversity, they all connect together and then create a, a, a much more vibrant uh, and a much more a richer uh, and engaging environment for economic social growth. Steve, as I mentioned in the last episode of SSTP, my chief guest was a well-known Fiji personality, Mr. McBadows, who provided some startling facts and figures about the poverty levels amongst our ethok community um, and uh, how there was so much of disparity between the communities. Now, you are a scholar of political science, sociology, development studies, etc. Would you please tell us what is the practice in most developing countries in terms of nation building through the formulation of well-targeted policies that would address inequality and economic disparities between the different ethnic groups? Um, yeah, I mean, say that um, say they're very different. Different developing countries are very different in the way they, they, they address inequality. Um, some are very much, and one of the interesting things happening now is that a lot of them are trying to tick the SDG boxes. Um, and in the process, they uh, they uh, um, either forget about the realities on the ground, or um, they basically take the SDG and then frame it uh, as part of their development uh, projects. No, equality is something which is uh, inequality is something which is uh, prevalent everywhere. Uh, some have tried to put together uh, redistributive mechanisms um, for or this in terms of uh, uh, land and production. Um, uh, and there's a push by the uh, World Bank, by the Asian Development Bank, by the International Monetary Fund for greater privatization. That's where the problem lies in a lot of countries which are still trying to uh, address the issues of poverty. Uh, we're still trying to transition from semi-subsistence to, uh, uh, to the market economy. Um, and there are a lot of issues, a lot of challenges in terms of uh, uh, governance, in terms of uh, production and, and distribution of resources. So they are, uh, um, uh, like in the, in, in the case of, uh, in the case of, uh, um, uh, let's say some of the Pacific countries, um, like, uh, um, let's say Tonga, for instance, uh, uh, 
Um, I'm just talk, talking to a Tongan uh, a politician the other day. So a lot of their uh, retributive mechanisms have to do with uh, uh, the kinship system, how they use culture as a means of redistribution. And that's something which happens in the Pacific as well, uh, where they still use some of their traditional means of uh, uh, reciprocity, of redistribution. And uh, a lot of the, the Tongans and as well as uh, around the Pacific, they rely a lot on uh, remittance from overseas for their resources and for their economic development. And the good thing about the remittance is that it doesn't go to the government. It goes straight to the people and they enables them to be able to purchase what they want. And so they use that kinship system and not only within Tonga itself, not only within the Pacific, uh, but also um, uh, around the world as a means of sustenance. So, uh, um, but amongst the, the different ethnic groups, um, it varies a lot in the case of uh, Malaysia, sorry, in the case of Malaysia, uh, they tried to put together the uh, new economic policy of of 1970 to address uh, ethnic disparity. Uh, but then uh, it went into some difficulties. It had a lot of success as well in terms of uh, education, uh, disparity between the Chinese and the Malays uh, in South Africa after independence. They tried to uh, do the same thing, uh, use the Malaysian model. Um, but there are challenges as well in terms of how some of the elites of uh, these communities take advantage of their power and position as a means of enriching themselves. So, uh, so you have mixed results there uh, from the uh, developing world in terms of some are actually getting poorer uh, and some are actually getting better, like Mauritius is getting, uh, Fiji always see, saw itself as, uh, 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 you know, uh, comparatively uh, over the years with Singapore, and now we can't because Singapore is right up there. And then also with Malaysia, but Malaysia is gone. Um, and with Mauritius, but soon Mauritius is gone. Uh, but we're still here somewhere. We, we, we spend a lot of our energy, not so much on economic development, and social development. We spend a lot of that energy on political tension and trying to rehabilitate after coup, after coup, after coup, after coup. We could have been right up there amongst the top hitters in economic development, but we missed out because we spend a lot of that energy, that intellectual, political, social energy that should be used in transforming us towards the higher echelons of achievement uh, into f in fighting and trying to rearrange ourselves uh, internally. I don't know whether it's political tension or whether it's political relevance that uh, certain politicians are striving for. Having said that, Steve, uh, do modern countries develop a conscious policy towards diversity and representation by all members of society to ensure good governance, uh, particularly democracy, and long-term stability and uh, security. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. That's what's happening around the world now, certainly in New Zealand, certainly uh, around you know, Australia, even in the US. I spent some time in the US. Every university uh, in there here as well, they have diversity policies to make sure that minorities are also cared for, to make sure that different ethnic groups and different cultural groups, different people from uh, uh, different countries are catered for. Uh, and uh, that's where the world is moving. And that's where we should be moving as well yeah, in Fiji. So it's a conscious policy uh, which is in place. And it's, of course, driven, like I said earlier, by the SDG is encouraging that and other international uh, organizations. So. Uh, uh, any attempt to push back on that, maybe an attempt to push back also on where the world is moving. Now, why is it that some countries or leaders cast others as racists in their narrative? What is their agenda and how does that serve their particular agenda? Yeah, like I said earlier, because the word racist is a very powerful tool that you can use against your enemies. Uh, you can frame somebody as a racist and then begin to demonize them uh, in ways which uh, will destroy the character. 
in a way which will overshadow the credibility. And uh, so that's uh, uh, something which is used deliberately uh, in, uh, uh, in various places. But of course, in, in some cases, uh, some people are just plain racist in the way in which they cast other ethnic groups as being inferior, as being not good enough and so forth. Uh, we have some of them here. Uh, but then uh, people are able to hide their ethnic prejudice uh, in very, very subtle ways, in very clever political, legal um, ways, uh, which can be acceptable. Because racism is uh, not only to do with words that you use, racism can also to do with the policies that you put into place, which marginalize some people can also be structural. This is what they call structural racism uh, um, or, in, or in, in endemic racism, which is to do with the way in which uh, uh, particular groups uh, being disadvantaged by policies, being dis disadvantaged by the way in which uh, the resources are being distributed, being disadvantaged by the way in which uh, uh, education, for instance, allocation of uh, scholarships and so forth are being distributed. So uh, um, a lot of uh, universities like in New Zealand here, uh, they have uh, equity policies uh, and people work in those areas just to make sure uh, that uh, any notion of racism, any notion of, uh, um, of denigrating a particular group will be addressed. Steve, you just uh, mentioned something interesting. You said that uh, some are very smart at uh, hiding their own subconscious racism, I guess. Um, if one is hiding one's own subconscious racism, what can the people do? How should the people react? Yeah, subconscious racism is uh, uh, because it's... Uh, it's something which potentially is, I suppose, everywhere, uh, because we all have stereotypes about other ethnic groups anyway. Uh, some of those stereotypes, some of those perceptions, some of those imageries are hidden. Uh, every now and then, when you get angry, it comes out, <laughs> it just jumps out. Or when you're drunk, boom. Uh, so, uh, um, and it, we have to address some of this. You have to look inwards. And some of the policies which are actually meant to try and avoid racism actually leads to racism. Uh, like yesterday, I mean, just now we we're talking about uh, uh, removing ethnic, uh, uh, ethnic data. When you remove ethnic data, uh, one of the consequences of doing that is that you'll end up doing policies which will, uh, in terms of outcome, can actually um, favor a particular ethnic group um, and disadvantage other ethnic groups without you knowing, because there's no way in which you can gauge what you're doing. Okay. All right. Uh, I would now like to shift our discussions to the electoral system in place in Fiji. As you know, the last two elections in 2014 and 2018 was fought along the new electoral system. Firstly, can I get you to please explain in simple terms, if you can, the current electoral system in Fiji, the DONT system? Yeah, the DONT system is a, a system of counting. Uh, it was invented by this guy, Victor DeHont, who's a, a Belgian mathematician. Um, but earlier on, Jefferson from the US, must have, uh, you probably remember him, um, uh, talked about the same system. Uh, so the idea was, uh, let me first of all talk about the, uh, um, the, the, uh, the proportional representation system, the proportional, represent uh, proportional representation system uh, and the counting system, uh, which uh, uh, John's supposed to be looking at. Um, so the proportional rep uh, representation system was supposed to provide equal a weighting to the percentage of uh, votes and percentage of seats won by political parties. Now, now after people have voted, um, how do you make sure that there's parity? How do you make sure that uh, um, the that accounting process leads to the kind of um, proportionality uh, which is being 
required. So the uh, deont is used for that purpose because some of the results will have uh, fractions. Like if you have 15.5%, uh, uh, you can have 15.5% of the seats because um, uh, otherwise you'll chop the seat in half. Uh, mm -hmm. This half will belong to Fiji First, the other half will belong to Sodelpa, for instance. So there has to be a counting system to make sure that it becomes whole. So that's how the Dihon system uh, was put into place, where you start uh, uh, dividing the number of seats with the total number of uh, votes and so forth. Uh, you keep going until you run out of seats and somebody wins. Now, mm -hmm. but there have been problems with uh, identified in other parts of the world regarding the Dihon system that we use. Um, first of all, um, it was meant to minimize um, the disproportionality. Uh, in other words, supposed to be proportionality between the percentages of uh, votes and the, uh, and the number of seats. But experience has shown that it's actually one of the least proportional and it tends to favor the larger political parties uh, and not the smaller uh, you know, fragments, the smaller parties. Uh, if you look at the Fiji case, for instance, like the Fiji first had 50.02% of the votes. Mm -hmm. But instead, they had uh, 27 seats. Yes. Now, 27 seats is not 50%. 27 is actually 50% mm -hmm. of 54. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... So if you just use a calculator uh, and then, uh, you know, do a proportional kind of calculation. Um, okay, what is 50% of uh, 51? Uh, then you'll probably have, uh, um, um, or 50 is about 25, isn't it? 25 and yeah. a half, yeah. Yeah, about 25 and a half, maybe 26, but then, mm. but then, but they get an extra seat anyway. So, uh, yeah. so, yeah, the, so the Dihon, uh, system tends to uh, give extra one or two seats to the bigger parties. Uh, and that one extra seat could have been given to another party, to a smaller party. Uh, but then there's another problem here, because uh, uh, the, the, the proportional representation, uh, which the Dihon is supposed to, uh, so the Dihon is supposed to favor one of the reasons why it's used uh, in the proportional representation systems that the, the proportional represent, uh, represent uh, proportional represent the proportional system uh, is supposed to favor coalitions. It's supposed to bring together a coalition of parties because traditionally only one party has been winning and there's one opposition. So mm -hmm. to avoid that uh, kind of one party type, uh, one opposition type situation, to bring in more parties for more democracy uh, is to have uh, uh, the, uh, 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 is to have a proportional represent uh, representation system which will give more chances to the smaller political parties from winning, uh, but because of the uh, uh, but because of the nature of uh, uh, the system that you cannot form coalitions beforehand, uh, mm. then one of the reasons why the uh, Dihon system was used is being nullified from the beginning. So the different technicalities, subtle technicalities, uh, which. Uh, um, uh, which has to do with the Dihon party, uh, Dihon's system of co of, of, uh, of counting that we're using, um, which which really does not serve the interests of the uh, proportional representation system uh, that we have. So some of those subtle contradictions uh, are there, which probably people don't uh, realize. You've mentioned uh, under the Dihon system, uh, fractions, etc. Let, let me ask you, let us look at mathematical democracy versus rights-based democracy. Firstly, briefly, what is mathematical democracy and what is rights-based democracy? Well, the two should work together in harmony. Uh, mathematical democracy simply refers to like one vote, one value uh, uh, that people normally talk about. And then you have the number of votes, then you have, uh, uh, if you win, a certain number of seats, then you, um, sorry, a certain number of votes, then you win a certain number of seats purely in terms of uh, numbers. Uh, that should actually work together. 
with uh, uh, with rights based right. yeah um, right, rights based democracy um, uh, where um, it's not when you're voting it's not just the numbers uh, uh, all those numbers re represent people's rights and all those numbers represent people's voices and people's choices uh, and those choices are meant to um, um, to give democracy its shape, give democracy its spirit and its culture. So democracy is a culture. Democracy is a way of thinking. Uh, it's not just uh, something which can be represented in figures and numbers. Uh, democracy should be lived. Democracy should be experienced uh, by, by people. So, uh, so rather than just reducing everybody, voters into figures, uh, which mathematical democracy does, uh, those figures consist of human beings who have ideas, who have values, who have families, and who have a history. So the two should connect with each other. So when one looks at mathematical democracy, then would it be true to say that this system, in fact, reduces democracy? Because uh, to me, it now sounds that it's all a numbers game. And uh, do voters have any knowledge of what is happening in the real sense of the word as it comes down to a numbers game? Um, yeah, I mean, in, in some ways, if you, if, you, if, you, if you focus too much on just getting the numbers, if you, uh, uh, for your party, for instance, uh, and a lot of politicians that do that, as long as you have the numbers, and that's it, the end of democracy. Um, and to some, um, democracy is a leverage is a means by which you can maintain your employment, your, your being in power. So when you go and vote, uh, it takes how many seconds to tick and then put it inside your in, inside the box. Mm -hmm. So within that period, some argue, some political scientists argue that democracy is only real democracy is only um, in that context um, where you actually exercise your right is only about three seconds or four seconds old, uh, along two, yeah, not five years or four years. Uh, because the rest of the four years you'll be living in the country, you'll have no right to make legislations. Um, somebody else will. Some people have more power than you. When they say one vote, one value, it's as if it assumes that everybody in the country have exactly that. We all have one value each. We have one vote each, one value each. But the reality is very different. We live in a very unequal world where some people have more political economic power and leverage, uh, and they're able to contribute money to the ruling party. Not only do they vote for them, they also contribute lots of money, and they also contribute a lot of uh, influence uh, in terms of ideas in the United States, for instance. The, uh, uh, some refer to the US democracy as a corporate democracy. There's mm -hmm. something like more than a thousand lobbying organizations in Washington. Uh, and what they do is they lobby. With the oil lobby, they're huge. They have millions of dollars they throw around uh, to lobby their parliamentarians, sorry, not parliamentarians, their, their congressmen uh, and members of House of Representatives so that they can vote for particular legislation, so they can push through particular legislations. Um, uh, and those are the ones whose value uh, are much, much more than the ordinary person. Um, and then when you look at Fiji, the same with, uh, if you are some of those people behind the scene who actually influencing a lot of the uh, legislations, uh, whether to do with, uh, you know, this particular issue or that particular issue, then your value, you may have one vote, but your value is much higher, much more. So uh, uh, while mathematically, uh, everybody has one vote and one value each, uh, but beyond that, um, some have, uh, while everybody's supposed to, uh, 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 yeah, uh, well, beyond that, uh, it's much more, uh, much, the, the, the inequality is much, much deeper. So if it comes down to a numbers game, Steve, what then happens to political rights and what happens to democracy then? I mean, effectively, doesn't it just reduce democracy? 
the powers of democracy? Uh, that's one of the big issues at the moment that are being debated. Um, what exactly do you mean by when you say political right? When, when you're talking about is voting itself just a because in some countries they have reduced political rights only into voting and all the legislations have to do with it when in fact like i said earlier political rights should be everywhere uh, in our everyday life not just in voting you have the right to vote and that's it um, and uh, and uh, increasingly uh, especially as a result of the corporatization of governments where governments are run like corporations where the ultimate authority is with the ceo and uh, in the civil service, uh, we're seeing that around the world. We're seeing that in Fiji as well, with the centralization of the civil service. Like um, even the civil service CEOs uh, have to listen somebody else higher up. It's all, all centralized in there. Then you begin. Then the, it's all to do with outputs rather than people's rights. Um, and uh, so uh, whether the output is sufficient is a uh, is, is efficient or not is another question. So often when you over control people, the output reduces uh, because when they feel that their rights are being uh, subjected to all kinds of control uh, and they have very little voice, then, uh, uh, then the output will be minimal. And that's uh, seen all around the world, uh, even here in New Zealand, a lot of employers are beginning to, 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 to see that. Um, now, um, so they, yeah. So, so that's, uh, um, uh, yeah, th th that's th that's one of the consequences of uh, uh, of recreating uh, the system in a way uh, which undermines uh, people's rights to express themselves. It also impacts on the output. Just to conclude this uh, mathematical system of uh, politics discussion, is there a distinction? between the rich versus the poor under the mathematical system of politics? Uh, yes, there's a very big distinction. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, one vote equals one value. Uh, there must be deeper uh, issues in that. Uh, because if you're rich, then your value is much more in terms of how much influence you can impose on the system. Uh, if you're poor, then your one, then your value in terms of uh, uh, how you're able to change things uh, in the democ democratic system is very minimal. So uh, it reflects on the inequality in society in terms of inequality in terms of power, also in terms of wealth. Uh, if you're rich and powerful, then um, then of course uh, you have uh, more leverage in terms of uh, you, how you express that one vote, one value. All right, have a break, Steve. You deserve a break. Uh, have a drink of water. We've been going for a while. You are watching Sashi Singh's Talking Point, and our chief guest today is distinguished Professor Stephen Rotuva, the director of the Macmillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies at the University of Canterbury. Please like and follow the SSTP page so that as many people can view today's episode. And if you are a newcomer, if you have recently joined SSTP, let me tell you that you can watch all the previous programs from episode 1 to episode 37 last week by going to the SSTP page on Facebook or even going to the YouTube uh, channel. You can watch at your own leisure and pleasure all the past programs on SSTP. SSTP, the Thinking People's Program. Steve, I believe uh, this is as good a time as any to discuss poverty, conflict, and affirmative action. Our indigenous community account for 192,977 of the 258,053 citizens living in absolute poverty, which is 74.8% of our absolute poor. Our Indo-Fijian community account for 22.8% or 58,933 members, while our minority community accounts for 2.4% or 6,143 members who are struggling in absolute poverty. 
If I may ask you, to what do you attribute this highly disproportionate figures? Yeah, um, thanks for the question. A very big question, <clears throat> Sashi. Uh, there are a lot of issues, there are a lot of issues over the years. And I think it's important to kind of uh, uh, look at how the intersection of all these issues all at once, not just one issue. The mm -hmm. governance issue, there are economic issues, there are cultural issues as well. Um, um, and uh, the development focus uh, in Fiji over the years uh, have, uh, um, particularly in relation to land, is done very little uh, in relation to developing indigenous Fijian land themselves. Um, uh, the, the the model has been based on uh, the passive idea, passive investment idea of uh, you're sitting there, you lose your land, and then pie will fall from, fall from the sky. Uh, you take your money and then uh, do whatever you want to do with it. So there's no attempt to actively engage the uh, toke uh, on their land in a sustainably, um, uh, in, a, in a sustainable way, which can generate um, long-term income and get them into uh, um, uh, into mainstream uh, economic development, as it were. Now, the uh, I have uh, uh, been working together here with some of the Maori, particularly the Naitau Maori community here. Uh, they have yes, come that's... a long way. They have come a long way uh, in terms of uh, um, um, from transformation from the issues of land rights into land innovation, uh, where they have uh, been able to set up their companies. And the Naitau Corporation is worth uh, more than $2 billion. Uh, they are into different businesses in tourism, in fishing, and all sorts of things, uh, diversifying. Uh, that has never happened to our landowners uh, in the in the years. We can actually, uh, you know, set up, uh, you know, farming training um, schools, mobile one, which move from community to community, uh, get them to be involved uh, with, in the skills and capacity, uh, with some money, of course, uh, directly engaged in uh, um, in commercial farming. Um, I remember having a, a meeting with uh, uh, meeting the uh, general manager of the used to be the, yes no Native Land Trust Board, um, now the Toke Trust Board, and I asked whether um, whether they can actually set up a uh, land innovation unit within the uh, NLTB. NLTB is just an administrative uh, unit, which uh, very passive in its uh, activity. Uh, rather than proactive in relation to uh, development of Fijian land. So in many ways, uh, developing that asset is very important uh, in terms of, uh, because a lot of those poor people uh, uh, would be based in the, in the, in the, in the rural, semi-rural areas, also in the urban areas as well. Uh, so uh, that's one way of, uh, uh, you know, developing that asset and then, uh, but, there are pockets of ways in which some of the Fijian communities have been able to use the land. And some of them are actually millionaires uh, by planting cassava. For, oh, sorry, not, not cassava, by planting yangona. Sorry, yangona. Mm. I don't know why. I think I'm hungry. That's why I'm thinking of cassava. Uh, yangona. <laughs> uh, some of the youth groups in Vanua Levu, in Kandavu, and other places. Uh, but now, because uh, there's no direct input from the government in the agricultural sector. They do have an agricultural ministry. They do certain things here and there, but it's kind of piecemeal here and there. There's no uh, large scale comprehensive attempt to try and get um, the landowners into agricultural business. So they have looked for alternatives. And the alternative, of course, like in my island Kandavu, is uh, marijuana. And according to the police, uh, it's worth about $1 billion. In fact, it's probably more than $1 billion, uh, say $2 billion. And if you, uh, with $2 billion, you divide by uh, the population of Kandabu, which is uh, around 10,000, you're talking about 200, more than $200,000 uh, per, uh, per year per, per capita. Uh, it's probably the, it's much richer than the richest country in the world. Now, um, so, 
So, so in terms of uh, addressing the poverty through those kinds of proactive using the resources available, not so much high technology uh, uh, is important. Also, you have to relook really at the kind of development where the tokens are. A lot because of the focus, they focus too much on tourism. Uh, they put all the eggs in one basket, as we all know in COVID, tourism virtually disappeared. And those who work in tourism are, of course, tokens, but they work in low uh, positions uh, at the desk, smiling at you, or in various other positions. Some of them have gone up to the. Uh, and, and so that becomes very much a very almost like a permanent part of the Fijian socioeconomic order, uh, when in fact a lot more could have been done. Um, and, and also the idea of stereotypes is very, very powerful. The stereotypes which has been built up since the, the colonial days that, uh, that the Tokes can do business, they can go forward. They, they're not good in education. That kind of stereotype is still very much strong and embedded in, uh, in their own consciousness. Uh, which uh, they have inherited from the, those early days and still happens in different ways. So, uh, uh, and then re reimagining those kinds of develop the development processes to make sure that the landowners can actually use the land. When I travel around uh, 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 Taiwan, I was impressed. Almost every piece of land was used up. Uh, and then uh, when I came back, I drove around Vitilevu. Um, it was the opposite. So, uh, um, so it's 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 being able to 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 provide uh, the kind of strategies, rethinking about um, using uh, the land and uh, and engaging with uh, um, and also learning from each other because uh, uh, what is happening in the kind of development strategies that we've uh, uh, gone through is the uh, uh, distinction between where Indo Fijians are. In the farms and and uh, and uh, and, uh, and the tokes, uh, the division of labor in the economy is very has been ethnic all the time. Uh, some of the skills learned in sugarcane farming, for instance, by the uh, uh, Indo-Fijian farmers, can be used um, uh, for, for for development of skills amongst the indigenous Fijians and how they can work together in a lot of local um, context. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot, lot to be done in terms of uh, in thinking creatively about it because uh, at the moment, the kind of economic thinking that we uh, are going through is a focus on the corporate sector. And in the corporate sector, there's very little uh, participation of indigenous Fijians in there. Uh, if you look at the list of uh, companies which are registered, uh, only about 10% of them belong to uh, indigenous Fijians. And uh, mm. the rest are for other ethnic groups. So let's look at the figures first, although the figures do not exist now, and see how we can make use of existing um, resources to transform um, some of the socioeconomic activities, um, which will contribute to enhancement of the, uh, of the Toke uh, uh, economic advancement. You, you've mentioned uh, things like stereotyping, etc. cetera. Um, what role, if any, can an affirmative action program play in alleviating poverty in Fiji? Well, affirmative action has a very bad name now, uh, mm -hmm. but especially because uh, it has uh, uh, the way it was used, particularly after uh, 1987, uh, led to a lot of problems in terms of uh, implementation and framing mm -hmm. itself and, and, and framing uh, um, on its own. Um, so, uh, uh, first of all, uh, of all the affirmative, of all the affirmative action policies which have been put into place in Fiji, the most successful one was in education uh, because it had allowed for a lot of uh, Fijian middle class to be able, uh, well, a lot, a lot of the tokes to become educated. Um, with scholarships which were provided. Uh, and that constituted with that big middle class, expansion of the middle class around the 1980s and 90s and the 2000s, which con contributed significantly to the economy and to the to political stability as well um, uh, in Fiji. If there was no, if, if, if you didn't have that 
a large number of uh, educated Fijians coming out of universities as a result of affirmative action then would have been a very unequal society. It would have seen more, um, you know, instability as a result of that. Now, um, so, but one of the problems with affirmative action in Fiji uh, in the early days, uh, this is where changes should be made. First of all, in the way in which it's being framed and understood. In, the, in New Zealand here, uh, it's framed along the lines of equity and diversity. In other countries in the world, uh, they do that. Um, uh, in Fiji, when they put it into place, it was based on the idea of entitlement. Or oh, I'm talking, I'm entitled to this. Uh, and also state capture, where they took state resources and tried to redistribute uh, some of those, and uh, often for elite enrichment. Political parties used it uh, for campaigning uh, and so forth um, as a political payoff. Uh, it also happened a bit in, in South Africa, in Malaysia, of course. Uh, it happened there. Uh, Fiji copied its affirmative action policies from Malaysia <laughs> and South Africa as well. They copied from uh, Malaysia and they also copied some of the problems which are associated with affirmative action. So that's why we have to rethink about it uh, in the context of equity, in the context of diversity, rather than in the context of entitlement or in the context of, uh, um, um, of ethnic empowerment, as it was in, 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 the, in, in the past. Uh, because uh, even SDG talks about it in the way in which, so you take away the word affirmative action and use words such as uh, equity and diversity policies uh, so that that can also bring in other ethnic groups who are not part of the exercise because the word affirmative action has some negative connotations as a result of practices of the past. So that's why we have to re uh, get rid of the term, reconceptualize it, and we see it as a way in which we can help build national unity. Because one of the fundamental reasons for affirmative action, for equity and diversity policies, has to do with uh, uh, peace building, uh, has to do with uh, conflict resolution, uh, has to do with making sure that everybody um, feels united and equal uh, in a community, uh, because we don't want uh, some people to be left behind. So, uh, so it's 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 a, it's a matter of rethinking, uh, you know, creatively, uh, and learning from the mistakes of the past as we move forward. All right. Well, you've mentioned uh, using the term equity and diversity. Uh, looking at it policy-wise, do you think the current government has done enough? to tackle poverty in Fiji, which some experts say stands in the high 40 percentile? Well, I mean, well, the figures show that poverty um, is increasing all the time. And of course, there are debates around the figures. Uh, the, uh, the government has its own, def uh, you know, definition of what poverty is and also uh, the figures it might want to use. Uh, but certainly, uh, the experience of people, the, the increase in crime, uh, the increase in violence, uh, the increase in, um, um, you know, the disproportional increase in the uh, um, um, number of people not being able to afford um, the luxury. Of course, the, I mean, this, uh, one of the problems is that we, uh, how you calculate poverty when people are getting richer and richer. In fact, a lot of rich people in Fiji, in fact, it's kind of uh, dragged the top part the top portion of the uh, uh, of the economy in another direction. At the same time, uh, um, even if people at the bottom they move up a little bit, that may not be sufficient, uh, given the uh, what's happening around the world in terms well the uh, um, the inflation and all those. So poverty is also not only to do with socioeconomic conditions, also to do with the perception of yourself and how you feel. Um, and uh, uh, some people call it the subjective poverty. And uh, there's a feeling of, if you have a feeling of, uh, of anxiety, of uh, the fact that you can't achieve things because others are getting ahead of you, uh, then, you are, um, then you find yourself uh, in a rather dicey situation. So uh, yeah, uh, um, in the circumstances, um, the, probably the government can do better uh, in terms of what they're doing at the moment. Um, uh, they're probably focusing a lot on the corporate 
sector in, in relation to um, advancing, um, you know, what's in there. I mean, tourism, for instance, uh, does tourism really trickle down to the poor? Uh, because a lot of the tourism, the the, uh, the salaries in the tourism, um, um, in the tourism sector is very low um, and uh, compared to other sectors. And it's, um, you know, it's trying to compare the, uh, the price of hotels here uh, some of them are much, much lower than in the case of Fiji, but the salaries they pay here are much higher. So within the corporate sector, within the tourism sector itself, uh, you have people who are making lots and lots of money uh, from that. Steve, let's move our discussions to Fiji and the world. Let us look at Fiji and the world. What are your views on Fiji attempting to highlight just about on every world stage, climate change, for example. Is climate change such a necessity, such a priority today, or is the plight of a quarter of a million people who live in absolute poverty, uh, that that should be the main focus? What are your views? Yeah, um, I mean, climate change has been identified by the leaders in, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in the Pacific under the board declaration is the most significant security issue, threat uh, in the Pacific. Um, and of course, uh, the world leaders in the COP, they look at climate as being um, um, significant uh, to the extent that every development strategies, uh, whether it's to do with poverty, to do with education, to do with uh, health and other forms of well-being, must factor in climate change. Climate change is something which is happening all around us, uh, either in explicit forms or implicit forms, very subtle ways. So yeah, uh, it's good that Fiji is uh, uh, is involved in the uh, um, the climate change issue at the at the global level. I suppose the uh, the issue is uh, how do you connect because because a lot of climate a lot of research done which we've been involved in here and. Uh, for instance, there are a lot of issues to do with poverty, which are linked to climate as well, in terms of resources and in terms of uh, uh, health, uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, uh, other forms of well-being, and uh, and whether they're making that connection is another issue. Uh, if they don't, if they are not, if they see climate as uh, just something different, something which they like climate finance to get money so that they can pay off the debt um, uh, or whether they are genuinely connecting the issues of um, a lot of issues of poverty and issues of well-being of health to climate because the way in which climate uh, change uh, um, impacts can be very very subtle to the extent that you may not even uh, feel it until it's uh, a bit too late and this is where uh, they would need to uh, engage, you know, um, evidence-based research, evidence-based policies uh, to look at the interconnections between those issues. Now, Fiji has been uh, building up military relations with uh, Australia and New Zealand and have uh, undertaken joint military exercises recently. What does this say about Fiji and its near neighbours? Well, Fiji has been like the naughty, the naughty fellow in the uh, in your neighborhood. Um, every time we have a coup, we get suspended from the Civil Land Forum or the Commonwealth uh, and sanctions by New Zealand and Australia uh, because of its central location, because of the significance of uh, the Fijians as a people, as a nation, um, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, are always eager to engage with uh, with Fiji. I work very closely with the Minister of Foreign Affairs in New Zealand. Um, they, in, in relation to the Pacific, they see Fiji as being uh, central to uh, because of the uh, existence of uh, regional organisations uh, in here. So the military relationship um, is something which uh, a number of things. One is uh, um, from the point of view of Australia and New Zealand, it's probably one way of trying to, to have some 
influence in the culture of the military, in the thinking of the military. Um, they probably fear that the Fiji military is still in its coup making thinking. And how do you translate that into, how, how do you transform that into a, a democratic military? A military which is part of the new democratic state in a very subtle way. That's probably how they're thinking as well uh, by engaging with the Fiji military, hoping that it will influence. Uh, now that the election is coming, hopefully it will not do anything um, uh, naughty uh, as we've seen in the past. <laughs> um, so, that's, so that's one. And also from the point of view of the big powers like Australia and New Zealand, uh, it's one way of uh, reestablishing their, their strategic interest in the Pacific uh, because uh, Fiji is where the connection with other islands uh, is situated. And engaging with Fiji would mean uh, that it would be in a position to push back on China. China has been uh, having a foothold, not so much military as some people say, okay, he signed this uh, security agreement with Solomon Islands, uh, but it's not um, as dangerously military as some people, you know, have, have tried to cast it because uh, uh, it, it was more to do with circumstances where they may be able to help rather than them setting up a huge military base. So, uh, um, uh, and from Fiji's point of view, it's uh, uh, it's it's one way of getting accepted again into the military corridors of the uh, of of our big neighbors like Australia and New Zealand after the relationship uh, went wrong in two thousand and nine. All right, I'll I'll address whether Fiji goes to the naughty corner again uh, in a short while. Um, you mentioned the Pacific Islands Forum. How does Fiji's position in the Pacific Islands Forum rank, given that at the recent Pacific Island Forum meeting in Suva, Kiribati was a withdrawal, and among a few other things, the USP Grand Saga did not set well with member states? Yeah, Fiji's involvement in the region has been... Uh, um, well, controversial, particularly in relation to the USP saga. And uh, um, in, in fact, for a long time, um, Pacific Island states have seen Fiji as being a kind of a, a regional bully, although Australia and New Zealand have been categorized as bullies. Uh, Fiji is the one who you know, categorized them as bullies. Uh, but the small island states, they also see Fiji as a, a regional, a sub-regional bully in some ways. Uh, in reference to uh, the perception that they took uh, Fiji, the Air Pacific, converted into Fiji Airways, uh, and basically uh, um, control it. Uh, but things were happening before that as well. Uh, and regional organizations, they argue, because they're based in Fiji, Fiji has uh, you know leverage over uh, over them. Uh, whether those perceptions are real, um, you know, but those those feelings are there and uh, so the USP saga makes it worse because uh, it has ramification all around the region uh, in terms of the education of uh, of their students and also in terms of a potential breakdown or even disintegration of what is actually the most successful regional organization they about eight crop agencies or regional organizations, USP is probably the most uh, um, uh, the most successful. If you get rid of USP, a lot of countries won't be able to uh, operate in terms of how they provide the uh, the human resources for their countries. So, uh, yes, yeah, so the uh, um, uh, Kiribati withdrawal, I, I mean, it's a long, it's a long story because uh, the new president himself has done a few controversial things <laughs> Uh, in the past, uh, one by redefining the climate narrative in Kiribati away from the original one, which was internationally accepted, uh, basically saying that climate change doesn't exist, <laughs> um, uh, almost like a climate denier. Uh, and also he um, um, 
basically destroyed the uh, judiciary in Kiribati. He got rid of the judges. So he's quite a controversial figure himself. So yeah, there are controversial figures all around the Pacific. Uh, so uh, the Kiribati president is one of them. What are your views on Fiji's role in President Joe Biden's summit with Pacific leaders at the White House just this week? Well, the summit was coming anyway. Uh, the, uh, the, the the United States had been thinking about re-engaging with the Pacific since the Cold War came to an end in the 1990s, early 1990s. The United States uh, closed down its uh, uh, USAID, age, uh, USAID office in Suva. Um, and later on, the Peace Corps volunteer scheme stopped. Um, the aid to the Pacific virtually stopped except to its northern territories. It was all to do with the Cold War, all to do with keeping the Soviet Union out. And now with the Chinese coming in, the United States want to, wants to come in uh, in a significant way. And one way of doing it was to use the Indo-Pacific concept, which consists of uh, basically two components. One is the Quad, uh, consisting of the United States, Australia, Japan, and India, and the AUKUS, Australia, United Kingdom and the US. And now, uh, after voices were raised about, okay, what about the Pacific? You say Indo-Pacific, where's the Pacific? So it's, Haha, don't worry, this is it. So what uh, America has done was basically to take the 2050 strategy for the new Pacific, blue Pacific uh, continent and insert itself there. If you look at their documents, that's basically what it is. Uh, they state, okay, this is what the document says, the Pacific document says, oh, what can we do? Uh, so what the Pacific leaders uh, don't realize is the bigger, the deeper American strategic interest in all this. Uh, on the surface may look like it's something which is good for the Pacific. In terms of America's uh, uh, you know, partnership with the Pacific, as the rhetoric of the signing talked about, the reality is this, America is not interested in the Pacific, it's more interested in the Middle East and now mm. in what's happening in Europe, the war in Europe. That's where its strategic interest lies. Uh, but it's only interested in the Pacific because of China. It is This deal is to do with keeping the Chinese out. So, uh, mm. uh, so that's why no one can claim, respond, uh, in fact, that uh, the Americans here, they took me to lunch twice or three times, uh, mm. talk about that, what they want to do. Uh, uh, and of course, the Chinese, they, they rang me up as well. Uh, what is happening here? Uh, so, uh, uh, so conversations around it has been going on. And the Americans were going to do it anyway, uh, because mm. they, uh, they're wary of their global strategic interests, particularly in the Pacific. And they're using the Pacific Island uh, countries. I know they, they, they won't like it if I put it that way to them. They're using them, leveraging them as a way of keeping the Chinese out. And they're happy with the money, 1.8 uh, uh, Fijian dollars, uh, billion Fijian dollars. But then when they divide it up, it's not much in there. For the next 10 years, that's for 10 years. But what of Fiji's role? Uh, how did you see Fiji performing at the summit? Well, yeah, because Fiji's chair of the forum anyway. Mm. Uh, so uh, is able to uh, uh, to be the star. And uh, so, uh, um, so hoping that it will be... Um, uh, it will reflect on the country uh, as the leading uh, nation in this part of the world. All right. Uh, well, uh, Mr. but again, Mani but Mara, again, yeah. uh, but mm -hmm. but again, uh, and how would that resonate uh, as part of the election campaign? That's another issue. Yeah. Because well, it, uh, all, yeah. well it all depends how they're going to butter it up uh, and and present it to the people. Um, I've got a very interesting question for you. Um, in um, thanking the uh, U.S. for hosting the first ever summit of Pacific Island leaders with President Joe Biden, uh, Mr. Mbani Marama said that uh, uh, it was an important step in the right direction, and he added that uh, they needed the United States to lead, to lead politically and to lead by example. And Mr. Mbani Marama said, some of the Pacific Island countries are barely 30 years old. 
And here's the interesting bit. He said, Fiji's new democracy is only eight years old. This is, our, this is what I want to ask you. What is Fiji's new democracy? It has only been in existence for eight years, according to Mani Marama? <laughs> what, that what do you on, say to that? It depends on what you mean by new. Um, mm. I mean, uh, Fiji became independent in 1970. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, political history, that's still very new, very short. Uh, yeah, uh, and of course, uh, our democracy has been, uh, um, you know, chopped up into historical moments as a result of coups. Uh, I, I think, well, if, if you're talking about under the new constitution, mm. then uh, it's probably right in that sense. Yeah, uh, eight years but old. You, yeah, under the new constitution, it's eight years old. Uh, okay. But if you talk about new in the broader context of uh, as an emerging nation since independence, uh, we have a longer history of that, yeah. Steve, um, looking at Fiji in a much wider or a much bigger perspective, why is it uh, that some countries, uh, even if you take Mauritius, why is it that some countries are doing so much better than us? Yeah, I'm happy that you mentioned Mauritius. Interesting that you mentioned Mauritius because Mauritius has been uh, um, used as a kind of comparative yardstick for Fiji. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's something to aspire towards um, in terms of its economic development, its growth, its uh, vibrance, economic vibrance, and, 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 and so forth. But Mauritius, what, the number of reasons why Mauritius do, is doing well and Fiji has a lot to learn from that. Um, uh, one is to do with uh, its political stability. It's very politically stable. Uh, and, uh, um, um, and its democracy is very, it's, uh, it's ranked pretty high in the world in terms of providing space for free expression, for, um, um, for communities to, to express their, 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 their views. Um, and protests can take place. Uh, there was uh, an attempt by the government to uh, um, to monitor what people were saying online. Um, a lot of countries in the world have been trying to do that, but there was spontaneous protests everywhere. Um, uh, you didn't see that in Fiji, not because Fijians are passive, simply because the, the fear of the consequences of that. Yeah, um, because if you create a uh, a political environment for sustainable development, then you're going to see the results. So yeah, the, the, uh, then you have corruption is minimal, um, uh, and uh, its regulatory mechanisms as well. Uh, it allows for development to take place without much control. Um, so yeah, there, there are a number of reasons why uh, uh, why Mauritius has done very well, and. Uh, uh, but, but I think one of the things, one of the problems that we, uh, we, we tried to learn from for a number of years since the days of Rotomara and certainly after Fiji first came to power, mm -hmm. was to learn from Singapore. Singapore was seen as a model. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a problem. I was in Singapore uh, some years back uh, doing a study of their innovation and how small states in the Pacific can actually learn from the Singapore and innovation strategies. I asked everybody, politicians, academics, and corporate people, uh, innovation, how do you do it? They point to their head and say, oh, this one here, yeah. We just think strategically about what we want to do to maximize the benefit for ourselves, one of which is diversify the economy. Um, we've tried to learn from Singapore, but we probably, I don't think we have uh, learned the, the art of, uh, of creative innovation. Uh, something which we can easily do. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe we've copied things like um, the yellow ribbon from Singapore. They were taken from Singapore and uh, how the civil service runs, you control them. <laughs> uh, Singapore is still very much uh, an authoritarian state. So uh, it's important to learn from others. But as long as we choose the right things uh, that we learn from others. You did this. Uh, I'm going to come to this in just a moment. Uh... And I'll talk to you about that. Uh, 
When I look at today's Fiji, it seems evident that there is an authoritarian style of government in place and that to a large degree there is suppression in so many spheres of life. How did Fiji end up like this? What are your thoughts? You just mentioned they've taken some authoritarian aspects of suppression from the Singaporean example. Uh, yeah, whether they actually took it from there or whether it's just parallel, they do it, you know, uh, is another mm-hmm. issue there. Uh, but certainly there's a, there's a lot of uh, um, parallel in terms of how they do it here and how they do it in Singapore, like uh, like making sure that what they did in Singapore was quite amazing. Uh, Lee Kuan Yew, um, uh, he created laws to make sure that the the media people and o- opposition they break those rules and end up in jail. Um, so, uh, I mean, uh, if there's too much of a parallel, just a mere coincidence, there's a, there's another issue there. Now, yeah, um, yeah. Th- th- to do the question on um, um, Sorry, what was the question again? Sorry, uh, I must have no, no, I, I, I asked you that. Uh, I mean, I said. Oh yeah, yeah. So that... okay, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, now I get it now. Um, yeah, uh, it's quite. I mean, it's it's quite normal for, for 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 countries coming out of a political crisis of coups, uh, in particular whether in Africa or Asia, um, um, to have this paranoia about security. Uh, that because you did it, you came okay. You may um, uh, the, the, because you're still linked to those the, uh, you know political circumstances, uh, which use force to come into power. Um, it might be used against you again. Uh, so whether you're talking about Myanmar in Burma, we're talking about some of the African states, um, uh, which uh, um, uh, came into power through uh, coups. They, there's a tendency to uh, to put into place mechanisms where they can uh, address and respond to uh, to the fear that which they themselves have about um, something which may happen to them. So they can, uh, there's can there's 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 what is referred to as the the, the, the security paranoia, um, and to some extent it's still around. Uh, almost every aspect of uh, the legislation has security embedded in it. If you look at the 2013 constitution, there's so much aspects of security here and there in terms of security is not so much just to do with uh, the role of the military. It's to do with how you control the mechanism, whether it's to do with appointment of just of judges, whether it's to do with appointment of the uh, police, appointment of the uh, uh, key people in power, whether it's to do with electoral systems, in a very subtle ways, they immerse themselves into the system in ways which you hope will address the issue of your own insecurity. So your own perception of insecurity is being institutionalized and articulated in institutions and legislations which you use on others to make others insecure. So uh, uh, in, in, these are done in very, very subtle ways. So uh, it's uh, it's not only in Fiji; it's in other places as well. So so that appears to be what's happening here, uh, in the case of Fiji, particularly as a result of the fact that, uh, and of course, if you look at all the since uh, the eighty seven coup, the two thousand well eighty seven coup in particular, uh, where some of those uh, the new the the, the nineteen ninety constitution and a whole lot of legislations were meant to secure them um, in, in some ways because they feel that if they let go, uh, what happened to them will happen, uh, what they did uh, will happen to them as well. So it's a, it's a kind of dilemma uh, which post-coup regimes go through. All right. Now, uh, you'd recall that in the days of past administrations, uh, governments came up with policies that was well-researched. I mean, they had think tanks. Do you think that these days the current government utilizes think tanks to arrive at policies, or do you think it uh, uses expertise of uh, professionals around it, or it's just like a one-man one man, one man band? 
Well, they, they probably have uh, they probably have uh, some advisors here and there. They have boards here and there. But uh, uh, I suppose the question has to do with ultimate power, where it rests, uh, in terms of knowledge. Uh, knowledge is is power, uh, and who generates it and for what purpose, and who controls the knowledge system within the perimeter within which you operate. So, uh, 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 yes, certainly in a lot of countries, a lot of res I remember sitting side by beside. I was in I was still in Auckland. Um, uh, there was a, a, a dinner at the university um, where there were some American officials who came, and one of them was an advisor to uh, Obama. So we were sitting beside each other. So we were talking, uh, and then he was talking about his experience as an Obama advisor. He said that as soon as Obama walks in, everybody's ready. Because as soon as he sits down and, okay, let's look at issue number one. His first question is always, now, what is the re latest research on this? What does the latest research say on this? Before they actually start talking about anything. He's very much research-led, evidence-led. Um, and research is done by a collection of scholars from universities they link to uh, and people who are credible. Uh, in their fields. Um, it happens here in New Zealand as well uh, and other places. Uh, and that's something which is uh, lacking in Fiji. Um, we don't even have a National Research Institute to do applied research on various things. A lot of developing countries have that as a way of... Um, and, uh, um, and so one of the dangers is when uh, the intellect is centered in a very, very small circle uh, and which impact on everybody else. So that's why it's, it's very important to have the diversity, diversity of views, diversity of intellect, diversity of uh, skills, diversity of uh, uh, expertise uh, from different, uh, you know, uh, from different angles to be part of the process of decision making uh, at the central government level. You, you talk of uh, the intellect, uh, let's call it uh, the brain. Um, is it a case that in Fiji the brain runs everything, that there is a divine brain as opposed to uh, a, a, a collection of uh, thinkers who uh, try to espouse policies for the good of the country? What of the brain? How do you see the brain? Well, it's always a good idea to have multiple brains around. Uh, which can uh, uh, think collectively and exchange um, instead of uh, uh, just one uh, operating. And uh, uh, so I think it's very important uh, that uh, uh, in the case of, uh, of uh, Fiji, a much more diversified uh, process of thinking about policies is very, very important. And uh, um, in some countries, they actually start talking with opposition and say, hang on, what do you think of this? Um, and what we've done is we have created distrust uh, and therefore the thinking process in relation to policies, in relation to legislation is very much uh, centralized. Uh, although one can argue that because they're elected to do it, but uh, in the bigger picture, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, for the good of the country is always important. Um, to do that. In fact, uh, it happens here as well in other places where in certain cases the behind the scene, um, uh, politicians from all parties, they engage rather than just centralizing the thinking uh, in one party. Well, I mean, in uh, countries like Australia and New Zealand, we have what they call is a consultative uh, process, uh, but uh, uh, some countries don't. And uh, so if you're talking about the brain running everything, the divine brain, uh, the, the superior brain, uh, let's not forget that uh, we also have on the other side the muscle. Uh, the last coup was brought about by the muscle power. So if that is the scenario that I'm painting for you, can the muscle function without the brain? Well, uh, it's a situation of uh, symbiotics. Also, so, uh, uh, it's a symbiotic relationship uh, between the muscle and the brain. Uh, it happens quite often. 
um, in, in many situations, because in politics, you need raw power. At the same time, you need uh, intellectual power uh, in, order to, uh, in, in order to function. Uh, I suppose uh, in the case of Fiji, there have been uh, voices, uh, you know, uh, discussions around the fact that uh, everything revolves around two people. Uh, one has the brain, uh, the, the brain power, the other one has the muscle power. Uh, and they become symbiotic in the sense that one uh, relies on the other. Uh, and of course, there's another circle around it in terms of those who uh, provide uh, perhaps uh, uh, some advice as well. So uh, 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 yes, that's the that symbiotic relationship between brain and, and muscle uh, is an interesting one, which you have, you have posed uh, and uh, uh, which happens uh, in various places. Uh, in the case of Fiji, um, it has, I suppose, it become, if you like, the central nervous center of the way in which the state uh, is run um, in terms of uh, centralized influence. But if, if, the, if the brain is uh, ever so controlling and the brain uh, is the divine brain, and if the brain stops, what then happens to the muscle? Can the muscle function? <laughs> Oh, oh, well, uh, possibly not, and vice versa. Um, so, uh, they, like I said, it's symbiotic, uh, one relies on the other for one's sustenance and existence. All right, Steve, as we head to the finishing line, uh, let us now look at uh, your analysis or your projections of uh, General Elections 22. By way of background, according to your analysis of the 2014 elections, you said that the Fiji First were likely to be in power for the next few elections. Then in 2018 elections, they got 50.02% of the votes. The earlier polls this year suggested their popularity rating, as we discussed today, dropping to around 22-odd percent. What do you think has changed the dynamics in the last eight years? Yeah, good question. Like I said, I think it's to do with uh, the the appeal of the novelty is beginning to wane. Um, like I said, we're experiencing that here in New Zealand as well. And uh, um, um, the expectations increasingly uh, are not being met. Uh, and then the issues of uh, poverty uh, COVID came in uh, and the, the debt level uh, and generally the mood. Sometimes you cannot pinpoint objectively what it is, but it has to do with uh, how people, the, the, the feeling of disillusionment as a result of what, what they see around them. Um, and people have moved in large numbers from instead of, pro uh, in, instead of uh, being able to express themselves fully on the streets, uh, they've gone virtually, and the virtual world becomes the mobilization center. And uh, uh, and, and 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 that's uh, and then you have pockets of, particularly for the young people, uh, the vote will depend very much. The election results will depend very much on the young people uh, who are at university, who are in high school, who can vote, or those who have graduated. Uh, more than 50% of the voters would be below the age of 40 uh, mm -hmm. in here, uh, in our own city here. Used to be very much dominated by the uh, National Party until the last election. Our university is located uh, in Ilam, which is the uh, uh, a blue ribbon seat for the National Party, very conservative middle class area of the city. And in the last election, it turned labor. And one of the reasons was uh, the students, they mobilized and said, we'll get rid of uh, the, uh, the National Party. And they did. And uh, now it's turned into a labor territory. So uh, mm. uh, people can actually act decisively to change things if they're not happy. And uh, especially the young people. So the political parties will be gunning for the votes of the young people. If you've made them happy, uh, they will happily may vote for you, or they'll probably say, Haha, no, um, you're not the right one for us. Enough, because they're thinking not about the present, but 
future as a young people. So uh, yeah, um, so the the, 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 the uh, yeah yeah I suppose what I, what I mentioned way back in twenty in twenty fourteen was based on um, mm. uh, the perception then as a result of the because of the results then. The same thing which okay. happened here in New Zealand. Uh, after forty nine percent, people said, "Oh, these guys are going to be in power for a long time." Uh, they may lose a few seats, but uh, but things do happen very very fast, and the world is changing very fast. Perception and people's uh, mood will change very fast before you realize it. You're gone. What is the best case scenario for Fiji? as the country goes to the polls, in your opinion? Yeah, I think as we've been uh, talking about, the best uh, way forward really would be a national coalition of all the political parties. Um, mm -hmm. Of the two coalition parties, uh, which already have signed the agreement, National Federation Party and the Alliance Party, um, and the National Unity Party, the Fiji Labour Party. And uh, um, uh, because there is, there is uh, uh, it's going to reaffirm um, uh, Fiji as a united country in terms of how different political parties can come together. And and indeed, the, the proportional representation system that we're using was meant a lot of countries in the world are using it. And a large number of them actually have coalitions. And the whole idea was to make sure that you have a diversity of political parties, of political rule um, in a governance system. Uh, not just one party, even New Zealand here, uh, they have, in here they have uh, both the uh, uh, first past the post, which is an old system, and the proportional representation system. And the proportional represent representation system was meant to make sure that small parties will have a chance of coming into power. And they have over the years. Uh, only in Fiji it hasn't happened. Uh, primarily one of the reasons is that they have the strict rule in the constitution about not having coalition beforehand uh, and also the uh, the counting system uh, mm -hmm. the which uh, which uh, which tends to favor single parties rather than uh, small parties now one area that i want to raise with you as we really coming to the end section 131 subsection 2 of the 2013 constitution gives the RFMF the overall responsibility to ensure at all times the security, defense, and well-being of Fiji and all Fijians. Does this section of the Constitution concern you at all in the event that there is a change in the dynamics of the status quo right now? Yeah, this has been concern uh, amongst uh, political parties and a lot of people in relation to that particular section. Um, I suppose it depends very much on a number of things here, just like any other constitutional provision. There are a number of issues here which we have to uh, look at. One is the interpretation of that section, uh, how it's going to be interpreted. Uh, and secondly, uh, who is going to interpret it uh, in times of crisis? For instance, who's going to interpret it? Uh, is it going to be parliament? Is it going to be the military itself? Is it going to be the president? Uh, is it going to be the courts? Is it going to be uh, um, the, the minister uh, or the prime minister? Uh, and secondly, is the circumstances for interpretation of that particular section? Um, mm. Because uh, that section can be read as, okay, we are here in case of danger, we will protect you. But in circumstances where a particular political group, political party can use it uh, and justify uh, the use of the military for the purpose of so-called security, national security to come in, mm -hmm. uh, say after an election, for instance, uh, and uh, you create um, you know, a situation which appears to be a security threat, and then you call them in, and so forth. Uh, and number four is uh, the issue of uh, um, because the military has a cool history. Yeah, 
how will uh, say the military or how will uh, the constitution makers, the people uh, in power now, um, can take away that anxiety. Uh, that anxiety will be there all the time. Yeah. Uh, and whether that particular provision was meant for something else or not, but it's not that, it's the perception. It's the, the feeling, the anxiety, which goes with that perception. Uh, is going to create a feeling of insecurity. So instead of providing security, constitutional provision for security, it can actually create conditions for psychological insecurity. Can Fiji afford to have another military coup? No, the answer is no, because mm -hmm. uh, we've had enough. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think three is enough. All right. Uh... We're really coming to the end. What is your message to the people of Fiji as they head to the general elections 22? Well, basically, uh, um, it's important to vote very uh, critically, uh, smartly. Uh, just make sure that you vote not so much on the basis of uh, not just uh, the part you like, but also the future of the country in terms of what you want for the country. And I think it's uh, uh, not so much for the very loud voices coming out and controlling uh, the sound bites. But also there are a lot of silent voices, which are probably good for us as well. So we have to listen to the silent voices from the community, uh, which is uh, something that we need to learn. Steve, uh, you are an award-winning political sociologist, a global interdisciplinary scholar, I'm going to ask you to take your academic hat off for a moment, and I'm going to ask you this question. Um, as a Ethiopian, as a Fijian, what kind of Fiji would you like to see uh, in the future? What kind of uh, Fiji would you like to see your grandchildren have? Oh, it's a very, very uh, interesting question, very big question as well. Uh, a number of things. One is, uh, I think, uh, the people of Fiji have, um, there's a consensus there uh, about, about how do we make multiculturalism work? How do we make uh, um, interracial uh, relationship work uh, in terms of defining uh, the future? Uh, we have uh, gone through um, this number of coups. We've gone through different constitutions and different uh, uh, governments over the years, but it appears that we're still searching for something. But if you look deeper inside, we have in many ways um, identified and we have achieved a lot as a country. Uh, and how do we capture things that we have achieved? Um, we have achieved a lot. We've also destroyed a lot in terms of what we've achieved. And how can we capture some of those? And how can we replicate it for the future? While people talk about Fiji being uh, defined by multi-ethnic tension, um, yes, in some at some point at the political level, but within the community, there's a lot of uh, uh, inter, in, in, inter uh, ethnic interaction taking place. And how can we capture some of this um, inter ethnic interaction? and then use it as a basis on which we frame the national narrative. At the moment, we use the national narrative to define everything else in the community. Our leaders define them because it's, the leaders, how they define the narratives are driven, not so much by the national interest, but by what they think is necessary for their perpetuity. So how do we um, capture a lot of the social experiments in the community? Uh, and then use it as a basis for defining the bigger future. And of course, uh, the future has to do with uh, uh, equity, has to do with diversity, has to do with uh, multicultural engagement uh, to make sure that, uh, uh, that when we talk about a happy nation, as we try to sell to other countries through uh, our tourism, uh, we have to be uh, uh, genuine about what happiness is. Uh, at the moment, we're trying to sell happiness. They sell it around here in New Zealand uh, on television. But uh, people begin to wonder, okay, how do they find happiness here? 
So happiness must be rooted in the way in which the social conditions and the political conditions are geared towards making everybody equal, making everybody diverse, making everybody and those voices come out in the spirit of democracy within the space for free expression. So that's what uh, I think the future should be like. I just have one more question left, but before that, is there anything else you'd like to say? Oh, thank you so much for the uh, discussion, Sashi. It's been a long time since we uh, first met, since uh, what, uh, in the early... Mid-80s. Uh, mid, mid mid, Mid-80s, mid yeah, mid-80s. Yeah. Uh, and of course, since then, a lot of uh, things have changed in Fiji. Uh, these kinds of discussions should not be taken, uh, not as uh, if people from the other, if if some people, uh, you know, say from the government are listening, uh, should not be taken as something which uh, um, uh, is meant to uh, destroy the credibility. It's part of the process of discussions, which can help them as well, in terms of think about uh, what others are thinking about. It's important not just to think about what you want to think about, but to think about what others are thinking about in terms of how it can shape the way you think about things. Wonderfully said. And uh, finally, Steve, uh, uh, what has your experience been on SSTP today? Do you have any comments about the SSTP program that you've just participated in? Oh, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. I think it's important to bring in different shades of uh, opinion and ideas. And I think you've done that very well. And uh, the... Uh, SSTP has uh, a long way to go, and it's going to be here for a long time. I know its, it's popularity is <laughs> spreading, so you're becoming a big star, Sashi. No, no, the intention is not to be a star, but you worry me when you say that uh, SSTP is going to be here for a long while. Uh, I don't know how much longer I'll be able to do this. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, but uh, I am enjoying well, the experience. There, yeah. Uh, there are no coups in radio stations. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, distinguished Professor Stephen Rotuva, my brother, big, big Vinaka Vakaleva to you, Dhanivad. Thank you so very much for being my chief guest today in episode 38 of Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Now, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you as chief guest. I thank you for discussing matters of uh, national importance uh, for Fiji. I hope our viewers found it uh, interesting. I found it inter interesting because I'm not talking to a politician who has an agenda. I'm talking to somebody who is, number one, Fijian, number two, who is uh, an academic, who looks outside of the box. And I found it very interesting. And Steve, before you go, let me extend an open invitation to you. You'll be surprised. And my open invitation to you is to participate in a special program that SSTP will host on Fiji election night when we hope to have a panel of experts to analyze the election results as they come in. I certainly hope you are able to join us for the election night special on Sashi Singh's Talking Point whenever election day is. What do you say to that? Absolutely, Sashi. Uh, I'll certainly be there if the uh, pay is right. <laughs> no, just joking. <laughs> well, service to the country. That's the pay. <laughs> um, Steve, once again, thank you so much. Stay well, stay safe, and stay blessed. Nisa Mode and Haire Ra. Thanks so much. Namaste. God bless. Thank you, God Steve. And I'll, and I'll phone you later. Cheers okay. now. Bye bye. Cheers. Bye. Well, before viewers, before you leave, let me remind you that I will shortly announce next week's guest. Uh, but in the meanwhile, I thank all those viewers who have taken time to provide their positive feedback with regards to this program. Some of you have sent stars, and uh, I thank you for that as well. I thank all those viewers who have taken time to provide their positive feedback with regards to this uh, program. And I will try my best to respond to you uh, sometime during the week. Now, some of you have been uh, writing specific questions. And uh, the way the program is formatted, I don't really have time to go back to those questions. Because as you'd appreciate, 
with Facebook comments page, the comments keep going up and up and up. So if you have specific questions in the future for any of our chief guests, please text me those questions on the SSTP Messenger page. SSTP, we ask the questions that Fijians all over the world want answers to. As I say, Fijians want to know. And if you want to share your questions, well, now you know where to send it. Well, that's all for episode 38 for this week. Let me now reveal the name of our chief guest for the next episode. My chief guest next Sunday is a medical practitioner and a former senator in Fiji's parliament 2006. Let's see if you can quickly guess while I read a couple more lines. Our chief guest for next week is someone who was the immediate past president of the Fiji College of General Practitioners and was honored with a life membership of the Fiji Medical Association in 2016 and has served on many statutory, corporate, and government boards throughout the years. Ladies and gentlemen, my chief guest for next Sunday will be My chief guest for next Sunday will be Dr. John Charles Fatiaki, medical practitioner and provisional candidate for the National Federation Party. That's right, I'm looking forward to a robust and enlightening interview with Dr. John Fatiaki. Hope to discuss a lot of issues in relation to the health issues in Fiji. We've got the NCD issues, diabetes issues the state of uh, medical facilities. So if you have any specific questions that you'd like me to put to Dr. John Fatiaki, please send them during the week to uh, the SSTP Messenger page, and I will put viewers' questions to Dr. John Fatiaki. I hope you can join us for episode 39 next Sunday. I hope to see you next Sunday on Sashi Singh's Talking Point at. Uh, 11 a.m. Sydney time, 12 noon in Fiji, 1 p.m. in New Zealand, and at 5 p.m. on Saturday afternoon in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Don't be late, or else you'll need a doctor's note to explain your absence. So until the next episode, I wish you all a very safe and happy week. In closing, I leave you with this quote from Woodrow Wilson. On the subject of liberty. Woodrow Wilson wrote, Liberty has never come from government. Liberty has always come from the subjects of it. The history of liberty is a history of limitations of governmental power, not the increase of it. I'll repeat that. Liberty has never come from government. Liberty has always come from the subjects of it. The history of liberty is a history of limitations of governmental power, not the increase of it. That quote from Woodrow Wilson. Well, that's it for episode 38 of Sashi Singh's Talking Point. Next week, it is episode 39. To all those in New South Wales, it's a long weekend. If you are having a party tonight for the NRL Grand Final, take it easy, enjoy, and if you are drinking, Please arrive alive. I hope you have a designated driver with you. To my friends, you know what to do now that SSTP is finished. You may begin your travel plans around 3 p.m. And in closing, I will say, go the mighty Parramatta Eels. Till the next program, I am Sashi Singh, bidding you goodbye, namaste, and nisa Goodbye, world.